Welcome to this week's episode of Conversations with Jeff. I am super excited about our guest this week. Uh, we have Brandon Howes, the founder and the head of Worldview Weekend. Thank you so much, Brandon, for joining us and sitting down for this conversation. Glad to be with you. I think we've known each other about a year and a half, and this is the first time we've ever spoken face to face. It's always been on the phone, never by Skype or FaceTime or anything. So, which, which is kind of shocking with how often we've talked to each other, but. <laughs> But, uh, you know, I have people I've worked with for years, and I've never met them in person. I had some people I've worked with for 10-plus years. Some I've worked with for 20 years I've worked with them mm-hmm. and never met them in person. Wow. Never yeah. never even talked to them on Skype or FaceTime. Wouldn't have a clue if they walked by me and <laughs> in the stomach, I wouldn't know who it was. Unless maybe you heard their voice, and then it's just like, oh, I know I know. If I heard you. their voice, I wouldn't know who they are. Some lady was talking to my wife the other day who's a regular caller named Zoe on our program. Mm-hmm. She calls it all the time, and my wife... Uh, handles all of our customer support. Uh, actually, she handles pretty much all of it. And uh, she was on speakerphone with this lady, and I heard her voice, and I immediately said, oh, I know who that is. And I called her by name, and my, I asked my wife if that was Zoe. And she said, yeah, that's Zoe. And, and I recognized her because she calls me to the show all the time. But yeah. I wouldn't know her from star, but I recognized her voice. Exactly. <laughs> well, I mean, in all reality, that's, that's the cool thing about technology just in general is, like, we, we're, we're so connected with each other, even if we don't fully – know each other or recognize each other by face we're just still all connected and all that kind of stuff so it is by text and twitter and and now by skype yep for sure so well i wanted to, well, wanted to give you the chance to share your testimony share how god saved you has been working in your life and kind of brought you to where you are now with uh worldview weekend and that sort of thing because i feel like a lot of times people they 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 see people like whether it's like you on tv or their favorite pastor or whatever it is and they they see them and it's almost like they're this caricature but i want them to get to know the brandon house so l- would love to hear your testimony well thank you i was raised in a, a christian home i attended a christian elementary school i actually attended the elementary school in northern virginia uh which is connected to a church that uh, mike pence went to for 12 years um, and his wife taught at that Christian school, although they did not go to the church, nor did she teach at the Christian school at the time I was there. But I actually grew up at, uh, in part, born in Jackson, Mississippi, then Washington, D.C. area, went to a Christian school there. Then we moved to Minneapolis, and I went to a Christian school there. I graduated from a Christian school, and both of these Christian schools were very um, uh, truly Christian schools. Many of them today are not Christian. They're just Christian in name. Uh, I mean, I live in the Bible Belt outside of Memphis, and many of the Christian schools are just really private schools, but they hold Christian names. I think at one time they used to be. There's one or two that are still actually teaching biblical New Testament, Old Testament survey and worldview. But these were, you know, this is back in the day uh, when I graduated. It was 1988 from high school, and so these were Christian schools I really went to. So I've, I've uh, between go- going to good Bible teaching churches and a Christian school, a couple of Christian schools, I, I grew up literally um, surrounded by Christians. And uh, I heard the gospel many, many, many times, and I could probably re- definitely have repeated it to you. Um, I made a profession of faith at age five and was baptized at about age seven. And I pretty much hung my hat on that my whole life. It was shortly after I was married, or not too many years after I was married, uh, I began to really question whether or not I was saved or not. Um, I did not have a uh, interest in studying the Bible. I was interested in in uh, a lot of issues uh, that might even fall into the area of biblical worldview. Um, but I wasn't really interested in the theological or doctrinal side of things. Um, and so there were other issues that just caused me to wonder: Do I really see evidence of being a believer? So I really spent several weeks and even a few months really toiling with this issue and studying the scriptures, and talking to some folks that I trusted, and I came to the conclusion that maybe I wasn't, and um, uh, I I appreciated that verse that godly sorrow produces repentance unto salvation, and I think it's crucial that we understand faith and repentance, and that they're two sides of a coin, so um, some would say maybe I rededicated my life to the Lord, others would say I was saved at that very time, I don't know, um, I, I, that's one of the things I want to ask the Lord is when, when was my name really written in the Lamb's Book of Life? Although the Bible says it was written in there from the creation of the world. Mm-hmm. But I'd like to know when that really was that I was regenerated and had complete justification. Uh, 
I guess one sign for me, though, is through that process of really wondering if I was saved and then studying some of these doctrinal issues and what is the gospel and what are the signs of a believer. It was after that period of time, however, I did have a keen interest in studying the scriptures like never before and really found studying theology and doctrine of great interest. And uh, a lot of things in that, in that regard changed. So I don't know the answer to that specific date or time. Um, I do know this. I've, I'm thankful for justification, and I'm very thankful for sanctification, the ongoing development, because we can look back and, and see that growth and that development and measure uh, our spiritual growth and our interest in spiritual things. So, um, you know, you'd have to ask maybe some of my uh, my wife or, or uh, close friends. I think some of them saw a, a, a deepening in my spiritual life that they had maybe not seen before. And again, that's either because I finally was truly saved and justified or I just really began to really grow in my sanctification. Mm -hmm. But either way, I'm uh, I'm sure today I'm confident today. Um, there's so many things we've gone through over the last many years that uh, I can't imagine handling these situations without being a Christian. So <clears throat> and, and the sovereignty and the providence of God in our life over and over and over is one of the things also that causes me to understand that we are indeed I'm saved because I see the things that God does in my life as a believer, particularly in relation to his providence, decisions that are made, friendships that are made, directions that are taken. I look back and say I had no control over that. That had to be the providence, the sovereignty of God, which is, again, another great sign for us as believers that we're in a fellowship with him and he's leading and guiding us. So mm -hmm. um, that's that's pretty much it in a nutshell. For sure. And then what what led to you starting Worldview Weekend? Because I know because I know, you know, you started out kind of dealing more specifically with politics and that sort of thing. And now you're you're kind of dealing with politics a little bit, but you're still also dealing with, you know, Christianity and you're dealing with just a biblical worldview overall and national security. So what what was kind of that progress that led to you starting this organization? Well, my first book I wrote in 1993 was called Cradle to College and Educational Abduction. And it was a secular book on the state of education in America. Michael Reagan wrote the foreword. I was the education reporter for Michael Reagan, uh, the oldest son of Ronald Reagan. I, I went on to become uh, a guest host of his frequently. I uh, went on to become his literary agent, produce his uh, life story into a DVD. He and I are still very close friends to this day. He was in our home having a meal not uh, but a few years ago. But we talk regularly and, um, and text regularly. And so early in my um, writing career as a published author, uh, I came to know him. In fact, I, I take that back. He didn't write the forward to my first book. He wrote the forward to my second book. It was through my first book I met him. When that book came out in 1990, secular book, I mailed it out uh, to every talk show host in the country. <laughs> I actually, back then, we, before we really were doing much, I don't even think we were using internet or, or um, uh, email or anything like that in 93. I got a book that listed, and I had to pay for it, listed all the um, talk show hosts in America and their address. And so I was really my own publicist. The publisher had one for me, but they weren't doing a very aggressive job. And so I, I negotiated a contract that said that I got to buy the book at 70% off retail. And as long as I booked the interview, I got to give out my own number. If they booked the interview, I had to give out their 800 number. Interesting. Well, I learned really fast that I would make more money buying the book at 70% off retail and reselling it than I would if I let them book me for interviews and made a measly dollar or two dollars for royalty. Right. Uh, so I, I understood real fast how that worked. So I found a company out of Washington, D.C. that sold a, th a three ring binder of every talk show host in America and their producer and their address. And I took these cases of books I bought from the publisher and signed them to these um, talk show hosts and sent them to them. And then I would work the phones in the morning uh, talking to their producers. And I became friends with their producers. And I began to learn the radio side of thing, which is uh, most talk show hosts are in um, an urgency for a guest. Mm -hmm. Most talk show hosts. Um, sadly, a lot of them are lazy. Some of them aren't, that's for sure. Then yep. the ones that aren't, they go to the top. The other ones just do a rip and read. Uh, they take whatever is off uh, at that time, fax or fax alerts they were on, literal fax machines. Uh, today, a lot of them do a rip and read off Drudge. But I learned real fast that a lot of them were looking for guests. Mm -hmm. And so I would become friends with the producers and get on the programs. And I was on Oliver North many times, G. Gordon Liddy, uh, Ken Hamblin, who was known as the Black Avenger, 
uh, Michael Reagan regularly. And my first interview with Michael Reagan, uh, I was in Boston, Massachusetts, speaking at a, at, a, at a school convention for educators, and I was his guest. And I remember being quite intrigued by that because I had stood on the lawn of the United States Capitol in 1981 and saw his father being sworn in and, uh, you know, grew up in Washington, D.C. I lived there when the assassination attempt on his life was made. And so I grew up admiring Ronald Reagan. And here I am talking to his son. And I was r really pleased about that, that he was interviewing me about my book, Cradle to College. I was on for a whole uh, 45 plus minutes. And his producer, Paul, who um, I became very good friends with, uh, said to me after we went off the air, he doesn't normally keep guests that long. Uh, he really enjoyed that topic. And uh, you should be really feel good about the fact he kept you on that long. He really promoted the book. And at the time, I had a 1-800 number that was like 1-800-444-BOOK. That was the, <laughs> the number, 1-800-444-BOOK. People didn't order stuff off the Internet. That wasn't being done right. in 93 that I remember. And um, uh, so I had operators that would answer that phone line and then fill those orders for me. And that day, I was on G. Gordon Liddy. I was on uh, Michael Reagan's program and another one. So I was on three shows that day. And uh, uh, that was how I was largely making my living. Mm -hmm. And I realized really fast, boy, you can make a good living uh, writing and selling books with this 1-800 number concept. Yeah. And so uh, within a week, uh, Michael Reagan's producer called me back and said he wants to have you on again. And then he had me on again. Then he had me on again. And pretty soon he found out that I was making the rounds to all these other uh, secular talk show hosts. And he said, if you'll give me the scoops first of the stories you're uncovering, I'll make you my education reporter, bring you on regularly. So I did. I gave him everything first. Then I would offer it to G. Gordon Liddy or Oliver North's program or Ken Hamlin or whoever. And pretty soon he asked me if I would sit in and guest host for him. I had never hosted a radio show. Now, I'd been a guest by that point on hundreds of radio shows, but never guest host. Mm -hmm. So I drove to Chicago and went up into one of the skyscrapers in Chicago and hosted the Michael Reagan show live for uh, three hours. It may have been four hours at that point. Uh, but I know it was three for sure. Never hosted a show in my life. That was my introduction to talk radio and uh, did that a few times. Then I got uh, uh, heard by a president of a radio network out of Milwaukee who um, said, this guy has got to be a Christian. The way I was talking on the air, he mm -hmm. could just pick, he could read between the lines. And sure enough, he um, called another broadcaster out of the Midwest and said, do you know Brandon House? He said, yeah, I just had dinner with him and his wife. And he is he a Christian? And the other broadcaster told the other broadcaster, uh, yes, he is. And so he called me up and said, would you like to come on and work with us? And I've been working with that radio network out of Milwaukee now for, for uh, almost 25 years. And so transitioned from secular radio to talk radio. Then my, uh, so when my first book came out, that's how I met Michael Reagan. Then the second book, he wrote the foreword to it. And then from then on, I just kept writing books. And now uh, the 14th book, just came out last week, Marxianity, and um, there we are, there we have it. So, yeah. uh, and, and since then, of course, now the internet has come along. Now we do email, and as you know, and and now texting, and now Twitter, and Instagram, and Facebook, and uh, uh, none of that was around when I was when I was starting out. And uh, you, of course, when I wrote my first book in 1993, you probably weren't even alive yet, were you? No, I was like I was six years old. Of course, I was alive. Oh, <laughs> what year were you born? 86. Oh well, of course you were. All yeah. right, so. I don't know. I thought you were younger than that. Yeah. So uh, I'm sorry, Jeff. So yeah. anyway, um, that, that's uh, the, how I made the transition from secular radio to talk radio. OK, nice. And so so then you so then now to Christian talk to from secular radio to Christian talk. radio. Right. And so and so now you've got your own essentially your podcast network. You've got it, online TV. And in all reality, I feel like especially within the Christian world, you were kind of ahead of the curve when it comes to having, you know, essentially podcasts. And the videos and the, you know, streaming essentially and that sort of thing. What, what, how did you see that coming? And did you ever realize that it was going to be as big and massive as it is now? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I did. I sat down in June of uh, 2006. Mm -hmm. I sat down in my office in June of 2006 and I laid out a business model and I saw what was coming. I've been in terrestrial radio for so long, and terrestrial radio, for those who don't know, is when you have radio towers that send out a signal. And I'd been in that so long that I, uh, by that point, that I knew what the trends were, were for the technology. And I realized eventually that we might be booted off terrestrial radio due to hate crime laws and fairness doctrine. And I thought, you know, we better develop an alternative. Uh, they can complement each other, but we better have a backup that we can go to uh, if um, we end up going with a liberal president under Obama, I really thought a few times that was going to come close. Um, but I also knew that um, if I work with these Christian radio networks I'm working with today and still am, 
you know, they weren't really doing the whole digital thing. So I remember calling up the president of the radio network I'm with now, who went to be home with, went home to be with the Lord, uh, I think three years ago, this December. And I said, Hey, you know, do you, would it be a conflict of interest or anything if I were to start a digital network, a digital broadcast network and, and do that? And he said, no, absolutely not. He said, only one thing, would you carry some of our programming? I said, absolutely. I'd be honored to. So I, I started that with his complete blessing. And so in June of 2006, I sat down and I wrote out my business model uh, and plan for a digital broadcast network. And it started out with articles. Now you have to remember, Jeff, in, in, in 2006, the technology wasn't there to do what we're doing today. Right. You couldn't you couldn't stream diddly squat. Um, the bandwidth wasn't there to do it mm -hmm. as far as video. You could do a podcast, but even that at times could be sketchy. But you certainly have a very, very difficult, difficult time putting out an hour TV show. Maybe you will be lucky to get out a minute or two, three minute clip at the time. Because a lot of people th at that point still were, were fooling around with very, very low Internet. And I remember back in those days thinking, well, it won't be long before a lot of people have, have uh, high-speed Internet. And a lot of people were still fooling around with that really, really, really slow Internet. Some of them still had dial-up. Yeah. But I remember thinking there will be a day when everybody has high-speed digital Internet. And when we do, we'll be able to do amazing things. So I said, well, let's build an audience first. So I started Worldview Times, and I said, let's start with articles. And then I started taking my radio show that I was doing, and I would load that up at night. And again, some people could listen, some people couldn't, depending on their technology. And so then as that ability became more and more readily available to people, um, I started going to people and saying, would you like to start a radio show? And I would teach them how to do a radio show and give them a radio show and then mm -hmm. started building worldviewradio.com. And then uh, in about 2000, I have to go back and check, 2006, 2007, we started television. A TV network was being launched on DirecTV. Uh, Christian TV network that the president of the network came to me and said we would like a one-hour live TV show I said I'll gladly do that But I will not produce TV for you if I'm gonna be on with Benny Hinn and all these other weirdos and he said No, we're not gonna carry that and so I began to produce a one-hour TV show known as the worldview weekend hour that I still host today and I was I think it was on that network prime time on direct TV at 7 p.m. Central time it re-aired at 11 p.m. that night I was on there every Tuesday night, I believe it was, for five years. And uh, and then finally, of course, I guess what happened is they began to need to put on more programmers that had the money, and many of the Word of Faith weirdos got money. Mm -hmm. And so pretty soon I saw that Sid Roth and these other guys who are interviewing people that think they're taking trips to heaven and swimming with Jesus and whatnot uh, were appearing. And the more that I criticized that kind of movement, the more I became unwelcome. And so eventually we were not on there anymore. And that really pushed me into let's now really launch our TV division. And so some of the guys that were doing radio, I said, it's time for you to do TV. And many of them had never done radio till I taught them. And I said, I can teach you to do TV. And so I taught them to do TV. And uh, by this point, the technology is catching up. The bandwidth is catching up to make it possible. And then we were one of the very first Christian organizations to have a Roku channel. And I remember going around telling people about Roku, and they'd never heard of it. Many of them had never heard of it. Many mm -hmm. of the ministries that I was talking to had never heard of it. Some of the biggest broadcast network ministries in America were not doing any podcast. They were doing nothing online, period. I'm talking about some of the biggest Christian radio networks in America. They mm -hmm. did zero podcasting or TV. Right. And so we were one of the first to do it. Uh, many of them never had a Roku channel for years after us. I think we were on our fourth or fifth version of our Roku channel. And of course, now Roku is being built into TVs now. They've cut contracts with TV manufacturers are built into TVs now. Mm -hmm. And so um, the technology has been fascinating. And it all started with sitting down in my office in June of 2006, uh, laying out a business model for building a digital broadcast network. And now today we've got a quarter of a million people on our email alert list. Uh, we have a very large text alert system we've been building uh, as a backup to email. And now we produce out of this stu TV studio many TV shows as you know, uh, Usama Dakdok, Sharam Hadian, Andy Woods, Tommy Ice. Uh, we have a couple more shows coming on in 2019. And um, it's quite remarkable what the Lord's allowed us to accomplish. We have a live streaming piece of equipment that's just a few feet from me that now allows us to live stream. Uh, that's something that was completely unheard of in 2006 when we started. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, that piece of equipment is about $8,000 just for the piece of equipment. Uh, but then, of course, you've got to build all the, all the servers that we use and the computer techs and all the camera equipment, about $100,000 in television equipment. So this is very costly to do to do it right. But this past Sunday night, we launched the premiere of our uh, one hour of our six hour docu-movie. And we had over 10,000 people live streaming 
Yeah. And then on Sunday nights, I teach a worldview class here. And we consistently have anywhere from two to 5,000 people on Sunday nights taking part in that worldview class I teach. And so for a guy that traveled the country speaking and holding conferences uh, for over 25 years this past February, uh, if someone had said one day you'll reach more people live in a worldview class you teach on Sunday nights out of your TV studio, I would have never believed it uh, that that'd be possible, but it is. And I get the joy of doing that and I don't have to travel, which I came to loathe yeah. the traveling. Oh yeah, for sure. Even though my wife traveled with me, we traveled in a motor coach uh, and it was comfortable. Um, I got where I loathed that. I went from flying and I hated flying. So I had to get medicated to fly. And so I would get medicated to fly home out somewhere. I get medicated to fly back home. I would do that four, four, so three to four weekends a, a, a month. It was ridiculous. I hated it. Then I switched over after 9-11 to a motor coach we purchased, uh, raised my kids on the road, traveling with us, uh, did over a quarter of a million miles, uh, sold that motor coach after we wore it out, purchased another one. And uh, But even even uh, the motor coach is as fun as that was for a while. We loved it for years. Like anything, eventually it becomes work, right? And mm -hmm. so we got where we absolutely loathed that. And it's funny because just as we would get tired of flying, here comes the, mo the op option of going by motor coach. Then as we got sick of that and don't want to do that anymore, but still want to reach people, the technology is now caught up where we can do it right out of our own studios. So it's the door, the Lord keeps just opening these doors for us for the next thing to keep doing what we're doing, but in a new way with t and taking away the uh, things about the job that we came to hate, either the flying or then years later, the motor coach driving. And now we have the ability to, to do it right from our own television studio. My wife is one of my producers. She runs the switchers and the cameras uh, in the control room and we work together and she handles all my customer support. And we just, we work together seven days a week and, and uh, it's, 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 it's wonderful. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. And you know, I, I, I can imagine it's crazy when you think about how much, especially up until very recently, everybody was just touring and doing speaking gigs and conferences and all that kind of stuff. And then now when you think about it, you could just stay home and reach 10 times as many people as, <laughs> as you were for reaching before. On the dollar. Oh, for yeah. Pennies on the dollar. For sure. Because those hotel ballrooms were costing me anywhere from three to four thousand dollars, depending mm -hmm. on some of the cities. Minneapolis, Milwaukee it could be three to four thousand dollars to put a thousand to eighteen hundred people in that room. Minneapolis, for many years, we would have fifteen to eighteen hundred people. Milwaukee, many times a thousand plus people. To rent ballrooms that size, you had to pay quite a bit. So you're talking uh, three to four thousand dollars for just one night of renting a hotel ballroom. Mm -hmm. Then you got to fly in the speakers, pay for their uh, airfare, their hotel, give them an honorarium, their car rental, uh, and then the money spent in promoting the event. So you have thousands of dollars wrapped up in an evening, and we were doing them for years and years for free. Yeah. not charging a dime and we just hope to offset the cost with a free will offering and then our resource sales where now we're reaching people for pennies on the dollar and we don't have all that expense we can take the money we're spending on hotel ballrooms and security and travel and put that into technology and that's what we've done for sure totally which then kind of leads us into you've got your book you've got your movie that just came out and coming from me from the outside looking in i feel like there was two events that I feel like kind of set you on this course to having sabotage the movie and Marxianity, the book you had. One was the interfaith dialogue with James White and Yasser Qadi. So that, that was event number one. And then the other event was the Muslim man who showed up to your, to your event that was armed, threatening, all that kind of stuff. So you have, so you have those two events that come in. And then the third one was this past April when Antifa, and Islamic uh, groups, Marxist, or Marxist and Islamic groups, and Antifa, like the Muslim Brotherhood, CARE, um, and uh, the G Gamaliel Network, which is a Marxist organization, uh, started by, a, well, actually advanced by a Jesuit that was discipled by Saul Alinsky, Gregor Galuzzo, directly tied to Barack Obama, who Barack Obama gave credit for helping him win the Iowa primary against Hillary and go on to become president. When those groups all joined together to cancel four out of five of our worldview weekends in April of 2018, Add that to the two other events. Mm -hmm. And when I was on my way home behind the wheel of the motor coach, uh, thinking, okay, we were not able to carry out four out of five conferences. You know, I've been doing this for over 25 years at that point. And this, I knew this was coming. Mm -hmm. I had told, in fact, I had announced that those would be our last five conferences that we would do, uh, other than our annual Ozarks conference. Because I knew this was coming. It was getting very dangerous. The threats we were receiving, I mean, in April 2017, as you said, we already had a guy show up with two guns and a cron. And then go out to it and put that on Facebook, film it live, and then go out to his car and brandish five weapons, including two semi automatic rifles and 1,200 rounds of ammunition, and threaten us. And he was federally charged with terroristic threats. 
So that was in April 2017. So I already knew things were getting bad. And so I announced that in 2000, our five events in 2018 would be our last free conferences we would do after really uh, 25 years and two months of doing these. And we couldn't even pull those four off. Four, mm-hmm. out of the five, four out of the five could be pulled off. So on the way home, driving back to the Memphis area from, uh, from Des Moines, Iowa, the only city we were able to hold it in, um, I came up with the idea of sabotage. I came up with the name and I came up with the idea. And I spent uh, six or seven hours on the phone uh, one part of that trip uh, with Usama Dakdok and Sharam Hadian and all kinds of people asking them what they thought of the idea and would they be in it. And uh, uh, Pamela Geller, I talked to her and many others. So... Um, yeah, that 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 movie was sabotage, which came out last week, uh, was born out of those three issues. And uh, you know, the movie is was only going to be three hours mm-hmm. and on on one DVD. I couldn't tell the whole story in three hours, so we ended up with six hours. And if they go to sabotagethemovie.com and watch the trailer, and now we've put up a free one hour uh, of the six hours. The first hour they can watch for free. If they watch it, the first hour is just is fast paced as the other six and the other six are just as fast as the first hour that had to be one of the standards that had to be met had to be fast paced on the edge of your seat. That was number one. Number two, everything had to be documented with either B roll footage. So if someone says something then I wanted to go find the video footage of that thing they were talking about, or that person who said that, or go get a screenshot of the Washington times or the New York post or whatever, whatever it was. So it was just so full of documentation. And um, we have sold the, the video. We, launched Sunday night, November 18th with a premiere of one hour Mm -hmm. In 24 hours. We sold more videos and more DVDs than I thought we would in the first month. We sold them 24 hours. So I'm stunned because we're now filming on what Tuesday night. Mm -hmm. So we're now two days, Sunday night to Monday night to Tuesday. So 48 hours now, I cannot believe the number of DVDs we have sold. If this trend continues, um, uh, we are going to be able to produce some incredible nu- uh, additional docu movies. Three of them, which are already in production, mm-hmm. for sure, totally. And so, so let's kind of get into the nuts and the bolts of this, in the sense of you've got you know sabotage the movie, you've got Marxianity the book, and I feel like to a certain degree, you know, obviously there is a there's a Christian bent to it, obviously, but you're also still exposing the whole ideology of. Marxism and how it's affecting our country as well as infiltrating the church and how they're using that within the church. Like is, is the main focus politics is the main focus Christianity is the main focus entertainment or is it all together kind of on three different fronts? Yeah, all together, but this is not a Christian film per se. I didn't set out to make a Christian film. I've been talking to the churches and the evangelicals till I'm blue in the face and I'm kind of to the point where, um, I'm finding more reception by non-Christians than I am by so-called evangelicals. Don't get me wrong. I mean, we have a, I'm not talking about the discerning Bereans or remnant. They get it. Mm -hmm. But the average evangelical in America, quote evangelical, I mean, I live in the Bible Belt. So you have to understand everybody down here thinks they're a Christian. It's part part of the culture. I mean, if you live in California, um, you probably don't really understand what I'm talking about because I don't think most people run around California saying, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. Yeah. Um, so if someone in California actually claims to be a Christian, they might actually be one because it probably than, would come more than cost. likely. Yeah. Yeah. It would it would come with a price to say you're a Christian in California. Right. Right. Exactly. There's no cost to saying you're a Christian. Here yeah. <laughs> in fact, if you say you're not, you know, it's not real good. It's basically the complete um, opposite in where we are. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, in fact, um, I remember one of my kids once saying that, that, that kids at school that did not go to church got picked on. Really? Interesting. Yeah, oh, yeah. So, yeah. whereas I'm sure with the kids in your state, the kids that go to school get picked on, or the kids that go to church get picked on. Yeah, exactly. School. Exactly. In this state, my kids would tell me when they were younger of kids that got picked on because they didn't go to church. Yeah. So, I live in the Bible, but I live in the buckle of the Bible about here in Memphis. And so you have a lot, everyone, you know, pretty much thinks they're a Christian, unless, of course, they're a self-professing Mormon or Seventh-day Adventist or or Jihad Islamic or, you know, Catholic, Catholic or whatever it is they might claim to be. But otherwise, you know, a lot of folks in here say, oh, yeah, they're, 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 they go to the big Baptist church on the corner. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, so um, what I'm increasingly finding, however, is that there are a lot of people who claim to be Christians and claim to be evangelicals. Uh but they don't have a clue what's going on, nor do they care. 
Right. But I'm actually increasingly running into people who are not Christians. They would not describe themselves as evangelicals. I even have some friends that would say, well, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. I'd have another friend who, who says, I'm an atheist. But my atheist friend and I uh, have better conversations than so many of the evangelicals I talk to, quote evangelicals. Mm -hmm. um, my atheist friend understands what's going on with Islam. My atheist friend comes from a national security intelligence agency background, uh, knows multiple languages, and knows what's going on with the Marxist. And so I increasingly were talking to people, uh, even some of my Catholic friends, um, who I would not agree with theologically. I mean, if I did, I'd be a Catholic, and if they agree with me, they'd be a you know evangelical, conservative, Bible-believing Christian. So we agree that we we agree to disagree theologically, and I'm not entering into spiritual enterprises with them when I interview them, or vice versa. We talk policy. Mm -hmm. I'm very clear on my radio show when I interview non-believers that my audience knows I'm not going to sit there and discuss theology with them. Uh, that doesn't mean that one of my guests might not express an opinion about what's going on in evangelicalism or may, may not express their uh, understanding of history, but we're not going to sit there and find common ground on theological issues. Right. But many of them understand evangelicalism. While they wouldn't call themselves an evangelical, they understand evangelicalism. And many of them have a respect for some of the you know, evangelicals in America that love Israel, that want to defend Israel, that get Islam. But many of them also do understand more of what's happening than the average evangelical. So because of that, I felt it was necessary to develop a docu-movie that would appeal to a wide range of Americans based on the values that come from our constitutional republic. Now, as a Christian who understands a biblical worldview, I know that our constitutional republic is based on a biblical worldview in many areas. That doesn't mean that all the founding fathers were Christians. Uh, I don't think Adams or Washington or Jefferson or and Franklin were, and, and I got reason to believe that from their own quotes. Mm -hmm. uh, Patrick Henry may have been. But they certainly embrace some Christian ideals, and we certainly know we can go all the way back to the colonies and find that to be absolutely true in the Mayflower Compact that they wrote before they got here. And uh, they're Bradford experimenting with socialism and then saying, no, we're going to go to private property, and if you don't work, you don't eat. So we definitely have a Christian worldview in the area of law and economics. William Blackstone, the leading scholar for the Founding Fathers, legal scholar, said that uh, when asked what is a constitutional republic, well, it's based on the law of the divine. What the divine is ruled on, we don't rule against. So we, in many regards, do have a form of government as a constitutional republic that does complement a biblical worldview or vice versa. So that's what I produced the movie on. Mm. Now, if people watch it, they're going to come away saying, I think this guy's an evangelical Christian, a Bible-believing Christian, as are many of the people in it. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't seeking to produce a docu-movie that was going to be preaching theology and doctrine outright at people. I wanted to be able to preach the concepts of a biblical worldview for liberty and freedom that are in accord with a constitutional republic. So people of uh, diverse background are going to watch this. I don't hide my liner or a bushel. Neither do some of the people that appear. But it's not so preachy that if you gave it to an atheist conservative, and I have, again, I have friends that are atheists that are socially and economically conservative. If you gave it to your atheist friend that's a conservative, they're going to watch it and be very, very, very complimentary of it. Mm -hmm. So it, I wanted to be as wise as a serpent but as gentle as a dove and open some doors. Yeah. For sure, totally, and you know, and I, and I I watched the first hour of Sabotage. Uh, I think watched it last night, finished it this morning. Um, but I I noticed that in in that section, a lot of it we were dealing with was there was Islam, but then also dealing with how accepting and protective the government is of Islam. I mean, I know that, and I forget what his name is off the top of my head, but he spoke at your Ozarks conference. But he Sharam Hayes. I uh, well, no, it was it was uh, the guy whose son uh, was Billy uh, Vaughn. Yes. And and he was talking about the the event um, where they were honoring you know his son, and they had a Muslim man get up and he's chanting, and yep. it's basically saying like, in in a sense, everything anti-American that you could possibly do, an anti-Christian and everything. He declared that he, the, this imam and this video footage, we were stunned. We were able to get our hands on the video footage to put into the movie Sabotage. This imam, you, we have the audio. And a picture of him, mm -hmm. and he's praying a curse over these Americans that were killed. Uh, there was many of them were killed in this chopper in August of 2011 in Afghanistan. 17 of them were U.S. Navy SEALs, SEAL Team Six. Aaron Vaughn, the son of Billy Vaughn, uh, his wife uh, Karen, they they got a video of the 
cer ramp ceremony where the bodies were brought back to the base. And this imam is allowed to chant and pray, and they didn't know what he was saying. So they sent it off to someone who speaks the language, I think it was Arabic or whatever it was, and they had it translated, and he was praying that a curse over them mm -hmm. and saying that the Muslims were the victors and that the Americans were health, fodder for hellfire. And they sent this to uh, a couple different congressmen, uh, a congress lady and a congressman, and each of them had it interpreted themselves by their expert and came back with the exact same interpretation. We were able to actually, like I said, get the audio of this. That's in the sabotage of the movie. Mm -hmm. This this documentary movie is filled with B-roll footage that will blow your mind. Sharam Hadian has watched uh, two hours so far uh, because, again, this just came out this week, and we were able to get him a copy. Uh, he only had it a couple of days, and he's already managed to watch two hours, even though he's a pastor and had a big event that he had to be at. And that's what he said to me today when he called me. We had the first chance to talk about it. He said, I can't believe the B-roll footage you were able to get and to back up the claims that are being made. He just was stunned. Yeah. And, of course, you're talking to guys like myself and Sharam Hadi, and this is what we do all the time. And when we're stunned, the, the average layperson who doesn't deal with these public policy and natural security issues day in and day out, their, their jaws are going to be on the floor. Mm -hmm. We're in big trouble. We are in big, big trouble as a nation. And we've only, frankly, got just a few months to fix this, and the window is going to close quickly. And if the next president we get is a progressive Marxist, socialist, internationalist, statist, whatever you want to call them. Uh, the boomerang onto conservative Christians is going to be like something this nation has never seen. And, and sadly, the useful idiots within, quote, evangelicalism are uh, building their own gallows. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a group, a, a group known as Common Good put together a bunch of these so-called – they went out there and were campaigning. They're also working to try to have the Second Amendment rewritten, these, quote, evangelicals. And uh, Robert Shank and some of Shane Clay Claiborne and some of these guys that I that I uh, deal with in the movie Sabotage. But th they're a little group of so-called evangelicals. They were able to help. I'm told by Sharam today, he's been tracking that group and the results. Uh, somewhere close to 14 congressional seats that got flipped. These so-called evangelicals helped flip them. Mm -hmm. So uh, we not only have to deal with the l people on the left, the left side of evangelicalism, we're now dealing with the useful idiots and on what's supposed to be the right side of evangelicalism, the conservative people, the people from Bible ministries that are tweeting out uh, that Jesus was involved in interfaith dialogue, which is a total lie, mm -hmm. as we deal with in the movie. Andy Woods and Trump Haiti and take that on. So, frankly, we're shocked. And I deal with this in the book Marxianity as well, which came out the week before. Um, this is 300 pages, over 300 footnotes. I, I, I wrote the book and produced the movie all in the same year. I'm not sure I'm going to set out to do that again. Unlike a lot of these guys, that they don't write their books. They have ghost writers. I write my own books and do my own research. I don't have anyone that does my research for me. I do it myself, and I write my own books. I have an editor, grammatical editor and content editor, but I do my own research and write my own books. And so I produced this movie, Sabotage, and wrote the book and researched for it all in the same year. And they both came out a week apart from each other, and yet they complement each other. Mm -hmm. They cross over each other because now we've got evangelicals like the Cultural Marxist Gospel Coalition together for the gospel. Matt Chandler, David Platt, Tibetti, um, you know, Mark Dever, Al Mohler. These guys are some of the biggest yahoos on the planet. And and what is shocking is that they actually garnish the garner respect from people. Yeah, you know, we're collapsing as a society. You know, I have friends that are police officers, and they will tell they tell me that the standard for being a police officer is being lowered all the time, and they can't believe the yahoos that actually get through they become cops. Mm -hmm. But we need to pay them a decent salary so we have basic economics 101, and you 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 attract the best candidate of a police officer. But when your city is spending their money on astroturf for for kids to play soccer on and building literally a hundred million dollars public school buildings one school a hundred million with a stadium that looks like something from the nfl which is happening all over the south mm -hmm. you don't have a lot of money left over to pay cops and so you don't pay you get what you pay for right so some of my friends who are police officers and police detectives tell me about these these folks that that apply and get the job and they're like i can't believe this guy is a cop and so we're seeing a dumbing down of the standards for police we're seeing a dumbing down the standards for being a judge. We're seeing the dumbing down the standards for being a, an elected official, a congressman. I mean, look at some of the clowns we've elected. I mean, this woman, this, 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 what's her name, Cortez lady, doesn't yeah. even know what the three branches of government, you know, judicial, <laughs> I saw legislative, that, yeah. 
executive. Yeah. She, she can't name these three branches of government, judicial, executive, and legislative. And so you're wondering, how does this clown get elected? Because we have a, we have a people, a, a nation of people that have been debased and, and dumbed down. Mm-hmm. And as you see the standards being lowered for police officers, for elected officials, for school teachers, you see school teachers molesting kids, having sex with kids, you know, teenage kids are having sex with their teachers. And you see all of the institutions and things that as a person who graduated from high school in 1988, you know, teachers were well respected that they would give their career in life to teach children or teach young people, pa- uh, uh, police officers, sheriffs, lawmakers. There was a respect because there was a standard. We didn't have to agree with all of them. There are bad apples among some of them. But there was a standard that one had to live up to to achieve to be a police officer, to be a public school teacher or a private school teacher, to be a professor, to be a a state senator or a state representative or a U.S. congressman or a U.S. senator or a governor. I mean, there were there were Democrats back in the 1970s and 80s that would be more conservative than some of the Republicans today. Mm -hmm. And there was just a standard within the culture that. And I lay all that out to say. Why do we think that that same decline of standards doesn't take place within the evangelical world when it comes to, quote, ministers and elders and pastors? Yeah. And I am just stunned at the clowns, the buffoons, mm-hmm. the simpletons that are now wearing the title of pastor or elder. I think many of them are fake pastors. They're fake elders. I'm thankful for the good, godly pastors, shepherds, elders that would lay down their life for the flock. But I'm stunned, and I, and I, re, I detail it in the book, Marxianity. These clowns out there that that are power hungry, narcissistic, self-serving, selfish. Uh, I think, frankly, most of them have don't even have the common sense. God gave a house plant and many of them couldn't make a living if they had to go out and do so. And so I think a lot of them have failed at other things. And so they go into the, quote, ministry. And I guess because maybe they see where in the Bible God spoke to a donkey, that means they they certainly meet the qualification of being a, a pastor. And again, I want to put quotes around that pastor because they're not. Mm-hmm. Uh, and when you're pushing social justice, amnesty for illegals, that is the plan of the Communist Party USA, where you got Aliso Medina on video bragging that if we can get these illegals become uh, uh, U.S. citizens and get amnesty and vote, we'll win every socialist election with every socialist candidate. And that video of him saying that is on sabotage. When you have so-called evangelicals and pastors signing on to the Evangelical Immigration Roundtable, uh, which if you go look that up, that is funded by George Soros, a globalist. Again, it's in my book, Marxianity. In, in the film, Sabotage, you see people. And if you go to that website, you'll see the denomination leaders, the, the heads of church evangelical denominations. I mean, I'm not talking leftist denominations here. I'm talking mainstream evangelical church denominations. And the head of their denominations or the former head of those denominations are signing on to the Evangelical Immigration Roundtable, funded by George Soros, who is an international globalist, who is just about as wicked, I believe, as you can get. And they're signing on to it. Now, when you have buffoons like this and other people saying Jesus was involved in interfaith dialogue and pushing all of these crazy things, clearly the standards of what it takes to be a, quote, pastor or elder have been lowered. And I think this is further sign God's giving over our nation. And I don't think most evangelicals have figured out that that means that part of our judgment is we're going to end up with absolute clowns as, quote, pastors and, quote, elders. Now, I don't mean real pastors or real elders. I put quotes around those. But the... People don't realize how bad the state of evangelicalism is, and most of them don't realize how corrupt, self-centered, narcissistic, uh, uh, double-minded most of even the so-called conservative side of evangelicalism is. It's become a business. Uh, I'm all for having a business. I'm all for capitalism. Um, You know, I write books. I produce movies. That's great. But I don't run a church, and if I did run a church, I would not use the church to enrich myself or my family members or anyone else. If you want to run a, a, a business, go run a business. If you want to go run a, a nonprofit, go run a nonprofit. But I'm stunned at how we have a religious industrial complex that is now passing as churches. Yep. These are not churches. These are corporations run by CEOs, and I, I may agree with a lot of what they're teaching. But what they have is a large Bible study posing as a church. Mm -hmm. Uh, When when you cannot shepherd these people or when you have elders that are on social media acting as bullies who have clearly disqualified themselves from being elders and you have these kind of people as your elders, then guess what? You have fake elders. At some point, if you have enough fake elders, what they're doing, questioning, are they really pastors or are they just big CEOs of large 501c3 corporations that we call churches. 
There is a such thing as a church, and the church is made up of a collection of believers. But these people seem to think that a church is simply their establishment of something because they could fill out the paperwork and get a building. Uh, and I think God, in many cases, uh, would will would and will spew many of them out of his mouth. Right, for sure. You know, and, and what's what's interesting to me in, is that I feel like historically we've always seen We've seen the good churches and the pat and the bad churches historically, right? And typically, it was the bad churches. They had the bad theology, and then they were also running the corporate structure, and it was just a money making scheme. You know, typically it would be the people that you'd see on TBN. It would be the people. It would be like the Benny Hens, the Joel Olsteins, that sort of thing, right? Robert Robert Schuler, mm-hmm. for sure. Rick Warren, whatever it is. Now I feel like now we're seeing the bad church practices combined with good theology and it's that blending of truth and error and because they have the good theology all of a sudden now everybody comes to their defense for doing the exact same things that all the tbn guys did in the past and it's crazy it's crazy to me how people don't see through it and i think a lot of it is this celebrity worship and all these cult of personality Mm -hmm. cult of personality for sure, totally. So why do you think that there's been this change so rapidly, so quickly, where even, like I've been saying, I feel like every single podcast, the good guys were seeing compromise left and right. Why do you think that's happened in such a quick space of time? Partly because of God's judgment, I think. I think this is God's giving us over, and judgment begins in the house of the Lord. And I think I think some of this is God's judgment. Uh, I think some of it's also the Internet with the Internet, the ability to watch what these guys are saying and doing. And then some of them, you watch how they behave on social media. That reveals a lot. Uh, But when you're recording and everything is going out there, you can go find it and research it and then check things out. You know, for instance, today, someone sent us or yesterday an audio of Alistair Begg declaring that, you know, Joseph in the book of Genesis storing up for the year of famine during the year of plenty is an example of the welfare state. And so here is Alistair Begg trying to use that text to say this is a good example of the welfare state. You can't expect people in the year of plenty to put away for hard times. You can't expect the majority of people are going to do that. And therefore, since the purpose of the state is the welfare of the people, this is a good example of the welfare state. And so what did he do? He stored up and then he gave it away. Well, then Alistair Begg turns around and contradicts the idea of a welfare state and says, but if the people thought that he was going to open up the storehouse and give it to them, they were wrong. He was going to sell it to them. Mm -hmm. Well, hello, Alistair. Guess what, then? It wasn't a uh, welfare state, was it? Right. Um, Just because he taxed the people and took a percentage of grain uh, and then turned around and sold it to them certainly doesn't make it a welfare state if he's selling it to them. But that's not what's going on in Genesis, uh, uh, an example of a welfare state. Plus, I would think Alistair at this point in his career ought to know what is described is not necessarily what is prescribed. Mm -hmm. So what is being described is not necessarily what is being prescribed. And if it is, then maybe Alistair ought to join the word of faith, because how is it that Joseph knew there was going to be seven years of plenty and seven years of famine? God revealed this to him in a, in a vision or in a dream, right? Mm-hmm. So if we're going to take that this is an example of welfare state policies coming from the Bible, then maybe we should also then also jump into the idea of visions and dreams. Is Alistair willing to go to that? I mean, does Alistair want to join the whole word of faith in AR type movement? Probably not. Uh, so how can he get away with this sloppy uh, uh, treatise of the scriptures? Uh, so this is an example. And again, would we have expected this from a guy like Alistair Begg? No, not really. I mean, but he is part of the gospel coalition, so I'm not really shocked, but I, at one degree, I still am shocked. So if it wasn't for the internet, would we know these things? So I think some of these guys have been saying silly things for a long time. Just nobody knew about it unless you attended that church. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that silliness would be edited out of the radio shows. That's another thing. Many of these guys on traditional terrestrial radio, they sound really good on terrestrial radio because their 45-minute sermons are taken and chopped down to 24 minutes or 22 minutes by the time they do the open and close and the appeal for donations, which is fine. So you got 22 minutes of a sermon, and they've pulled out the best of the best. Any off-the-cuff remarks are cut out. So you listen to a guy on terrestrial radio with a Bible teaching program, you're like, he's rock solid. Well— All the garbage was just cut out. Mm -hmm. On the internet, you're getting the full thing. So I think part of it's always been there. I also think some of these guys have always been liberal. Um, Now they're just willing to be more comfortable with it as it becomes more and more mainstream. It's now safe to say the things they've always believed. They just guarded what they would say. And and as the trends change, 
many of these guys are pragmatists. It's funny because a lot of them preach against pragmatism, but I think some of them are the king of pragmatism. And now as the trends are changing and young people are becoming more liberal within so-called evangelicalism, they're becoming a little more progressive themselves and hanging out with social justice warriors and and the people teaching goofy things and part of the Gospel Coalition and pe teaching white privilege and pushing for amnesty and pushing IFD. And yet they're hanging out with them. And you're like, why on earth are you doing this? All I can assume is either they have always were a little liberal. They just had to be careful not to be a part of that so they didn't offend their base who gives them the money, the older people. And or if their base is now dying off and they need to appeal to a new base, they now are going to go ahead and appeal to this liberal generate more liberal generation to, to harvest new donors. So I think there's a lot of pragmatism and a lot of reasons why we're now seeing what we're seeing. Right, for sure. And, and it's, it's really interesting because I feel like all of all of the guys that I feel like I used to look up to and that I feel like the majority of solid Christians used to look up to, whether it was Al Mohler or John Piper. I mean, you've got Al Mohler that's now saying that homosexuality is no isn't a choice and that he's repented of that you've got john piper oh i know i know i know it's going to be in there i mean you've got you've got john piper that's anti-second amendment you've got you all these guys that are compromising left and right and like you're saying is it's like have they always been this leftist or is this a new thing and they're just appealing to the new younger crowd and it's just it, it's mind-boggling well, to something, me you know alistair Begg and his in his old sermonette on uh, the welfare state coming out of the story of Joseph, says to quote John Stott, you know, John Stott was a leftist a long time ago, but here he is still quoting John Stott. And he says, John Stott said in communism, under communism, man exploits man. And under capitalism, it's the other way around. And everybody in his church audience laughs. So here he is bemoaning capitalism. Capitalism isn't a perfect system, but capitalism or free market system is based on biblical philosophies or ideas or or truth, private contract, honor your word, uh, gain wealth over the course of time by putting your hand to the plow, save, conserve, avoid debt. I mean, be, be honest with your workers. I mean, there's a lot of things uh, inside. Uh, don't be lazy. Don't be slothful. Uh, there's a lot of things in the free market system that really come right out of the Bible. And those principles and ideas work for the saved as well as the unsaved, just as the rain falls on the fields of the just and the unjust. But here you have a guy like Alistair Begg quoting John Stott. So I think some of these – and John Stott has been around a long time. I think he's dead now, of course, but, but a lot of guys have been following him a long time. And I'm starting to wonder if some of these guys they weren't following for years have led them into becoming more, more and more liberal. You talk about John Piper. John Piper, I think, has been a liberal a long, long time. Mm -hmm. We can go back and find that he's praising um, uh, some of the leaders of the New Apostolic Reformation – um, one of the men who started the New Apostolic Reformation, he's praised. Uh, we find him praising some of the prophets of that era and talking about the prophets, uh, these these modern day prophets, not the prophets of the Bible. Uh, but to see Peter Wagner, he's praised. He's praised uh, the books by people like um, uh, the, the contemplative prayer writer. His name uh, will come to me in a minute, but mm -hmm. he's written on contemplative prayer and talks about having an out of body experience and and uh, astro travel. Um, uh, you know, he praises him, as I document in my book, Religious Trojan Horse. Um, uh, Piper has also made some comments that I think are very, very close, if not crossing the line of anti-Semitism. He has written and stated things about the nation state of Israel that are 100 percent false, that are just pro-PLO. Um, so John Piper has been a liberal, I think, for a long, long time. I think mm -hmm. John Piper is a false gospel. Well, yeah. He wrote his of 2017 that for final salvation one must sl uh, slay sin and pursue holiness for final salvation that's works mm -hmm. so I, I, his his christian hedonism is a problem he's saying the ten commandments are not for today when nine of the ten commandments are repeated in the new testament when he says as we have on video you cannot uh, judge uh, sin by commandment keeping or commandment breaking that adam and eve uh weren't kicked out of the garden for commandment breaking ultimately, but because they didn't seek their highest pleasure in God. I mean, this is all on video. Yeah. Now, of course, the useful idiots that drink his Kool-Aid and defend him will say, that's not true. That's not true. Uh, but then we have the videos. And then when we show them the videos, they just, you know, they don't they don't want to say, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't understand. You know, we have these morons out there. And, and the word moros is from which we get the word stupid or, or ignorant or ignoramus. Moros. It's a biblical term. And these people are morons, uh, biblically speaking, and they will get out there on social media 
and accuse us of stuff or say, hey, that's conspiracy or that's not true or you're taking it out of context. And then when we provide them with the actual video clips, and sometimes it's them saying it, they won't admit and say, oh, I'm sorry, I was wrong. You know, they're so moronic, they, they, they don't even know that we know what they said better than what they actually said. It came from them. Mm -hmm. But see, this, again, I think is a, an example of the debased person, the, the depraved, debased mind we're dealing with. Most of these people, again, within evangelicalism, they got where they are, not because they're real bright. They got where they are because a lot of people don't even want the job. OK, right. I mean, we're living in an era and a time where most people don't want these jobs and they don't want to be a part of this movement or the, have these jobs or do these things. And it's kind of left up to these guys and they do it. Now, again, we have wonderful pastors who are real shepherds, real pastors, and they many of them clean the bathrooms. They vacuum. Uh, they clean the church every Sunday or to get it ready for Sunday. They marry. They bury. They counsel. They prepare a sermon. You know, the rewards for those real pastors is going to be immense. Mm -hmm. And then we have these other guys that are pretenders. And if you looked at their credit scores, their bankruptcies, their failed marriages, and yet here they are pounding the pulpit on how you got to submit yourself to me. you got to submit yourself to the elders. Submit yourself to the elders. Well, these clowns don't even know that the, the scripture in Hebrews, submit yourself, is actually translated, be persuaded by the truth they preach. Be persuaded by the truth they proclaim. So you're surrendering to the authority of Scripture and the authority of the Holy Spirit. But it's even more than that. Submit yourself to the truth they teach like you're following a guide through a wooded, rocky, mountainous trail. So you're emulating your leader. Mm -hmm. As your leader moves through the trail and avoids stepping off into an area that's dangerous, you mimic that. And then we we, we see that, in other words— they're being servant leaders. Right. Well, many of these leaders today, you wouldn't want to mimic their private life. You wouldn't want to l l mimic their finances. You wouldn't want to mimic their work ethic. Uh, and so yet they are the ones to quickly pound the table about submitting to me. Why? Because many of them are in, the, for, in it for the wrong reasons. It's attracted a narcissistic, self-centered. Uh, in some cases, I think some of these people, are fi frankly, are sociopathic. Uh, and so it's very, very sad because, again, the standards have been rewritten for what has allowed someone to become a pastor or elder to the point I think some of these groups have now actually become theological cults. They have a false gospel, a works-based gospel, and they have tyrants and dictators for, for pastors and elders, and they just are consumed with power. And mm -hmm. that is the absolute opposite of the biblical description of a biblical elder and a biblical pastor. And yet they wear the title pastor. Yep. You know, there's nothing that upsets police more than a crooked police officer. Right. There's nothing that upsets a good school teacher more than a perverted school teacher that's uh, sexually abusing kids. There's nothing that's more uh, uh, disgusting to to um, someone in the FBI than a crooked FBI agent. Well, the tr same is true with people in ministry. There's nothing more offensive to people in ministry or pastors or elders than people who are in those jobs that are crooked or in it for the wrong reason, give us all a bad name. So I think we have a real problem today within evangelicalism as to who is becoming pastors and elders and why. And, and again, I consider most of this to be an industrial religious complex. Look, I write and produce Christian movies or DVDs or books. Great. I'm not a pastor. I'm not an elder. I'm not, I'm not qualified in many regards to be a pastor or an elder. I don't have the temperament for it. But there are people out there that are. Why are we not elevating those people more? Mm -hmm. Why are we not going and finding them more? You know why? Because largely today, we have a system that says, you choose, you go to college, and you, and you go to seminary, and you pay for it, and, and you become a pastor, and it's self-appointed. Yeah. Well, what about the guy who's really qualified, but he doesn't have the funds to go to college or seminary? Why are we not training more of them in our own churches and looking for them at an early age and saying, you know what, you have the gifts and the heart to be a pastor, and our church will help you get through seminary and, and help you. Have you considered that? You know. And some may say, well, no, I was going to be an engineer, or I was going to be a dentist, or whatever. And maybe they sacrifice that, become a pastor. I think the way we've picked our leaders today is completely unbiblical. And many of our pastors used to come from our own seminaries, our own Bible colleges, inside our own churches. Many of them, to be a Sunday school teacher, you had to go through the, the, the church's Bible school. The, school would have a, the church would have a Bible school. And to be a Sunday school teacher, you had to go through the Bible school on, on the evenings or weekends. So you still had a job. You were out in the business world. Mm -hmm. But to be a, school, uh, a Sunday school teacher, you had to go through the informal Bible school on weeknights or weekends until they knew you were qualified to teach. Well, we should be putting many of our young men through seminary the same way 
instead of seeing them off to some of these goofy seminaries and colleges, equip them, train them up in our own churches, and then ordain them. Instead, today, the, just the guy who is saying, I, I need to have the adulation of people, he just decides he wants to become a pastor, and therefore he's a pastor. I don't. Yeah. I just don't think this model is very biblical. It's not biblical at all. And I, and I think, you know, because, you know, I, w- I went through the process in the sense of I, w- I went to college, major, I was majoring in Christian ministries, that sort of thing. But as I'm looking back on it, I'm sitting here thinking, okay, I was 18, 19 years old, and I'm making the decision to go into ministry but what if by the time I go through all that, you know, what, six, seven years, go, by the time you go through seminary and all that kind of stuff, and then you get out and then you're like, okay, now I got to go find a job. And it's just like a regular career. Then you got to put out your resume. You got to go in for interviews or whatever it is, as opposed to churches raising up leaders from within and not everybody looking for that senior pastor gig. Because everybody wants that senior pastor gig because that's when you can write the books. It's when you can speak at the conferences. It's when you can do all that kind of stuff. And that's where I feel like the whole system is broken to a certain degree. You know, I think that, you know, like it, there's the there's the TV show, and I know I cite it all the time, but it's Leah Remini's show, it's, uh, Scientology, The Aftermath. And there's so many parallels between that show and what's happening in Scientology and Jehovah's Witnesses and what's happening within the church right now. I mean, there's there's bullying there's if you're critical of a celebrity pastor, they're going to set out to destroy you. And you and I know that very well. I mean, yeah. you know, it's if you leave, if you leave the church as as not that I've left the church, but now I've been critical of the church that I used to go to. Then they set out to destroy you even more, set up fake Twitter accounts. I mean, that's a, like an identical thing to Scientology. But what's happening is now you're taking the cult, the cult mindset and the cult strategy and combining it with good theology and it's, I think it's just to protect the income. It's to protect the money. And that, I think the whole system is, is just set up wrong. And I, it, you know, at a certain point, it's like, we're almost at that point where we need that Martin Luther moment. And it's just, we're going to start over, start over from scratch, I think. And, and you wonder why a lot of folks see the way police are treated. And they say, as a young person, I don't want to become a police officer. Mm-hmm. You know, look, look at how they're treated. Look at look at uh, the standards. Look at the people who are allowed to become police officers. You know, the standards should be high to be a police officer. And when you lower the standard, the people who love high standards, they don't want to go be a police officer. If a police department in a town is known for not having high standards, someone who loves high standards doesn't want to go join that police department. Right. Right. The same thing is true with a school. If a school is known for having really bad teachers and bad test scores and the kids are running the school and it's got crime in it and, and the teachers are, are, are undisciplined and maybe don't even qualify to be teachers and academically themselves uh, couldn't even pass a proficiency test themselves. Well, a high trained school teacher doesn't want to go and be in that school. Well, the, the same is true right on down the line. You know, if you're a stockbroker, you want to go to a, a firm that is respected, not somebody that's known for being a cheesy, corrupt you know, firm or, or a lawyer or whatever it is. Well, I think the same is true in the area of the pastorate and the ministry today. I think there are a lot of young people looking at the state of modern day evangelicalism and they're saying, I don't want to go be a part of that. The standards have been lowered for what it takes. And if that guy can become a pastor or or this is what it takes to be a pastor and be successful today, I don't want to do that. If I have to turn into that kind of person to be successful in the quote ministry today, I don't want to do that. And so I think, again, by lowering the standards, we're losing a lot of good people who say, I just don't want to be a part of that. I, I have a friend of mine who who went to seminary. And when he got out, he looked around and saw what was happening. And he said, I don't want to have to play the game, play it and make it a game where you have to play this quote game to have a ministry, to be a pastor, to get ahead. I don't want, I didn't realize that's what it was like. And he went back into the business world. He didn't even use his degree. And I've asked him, why are you not a pastor? And he said, he told me why. And so again, that doesn't mean we don't have pastors that are doing it right. That doesn't mean we don't have churches that aren't doing it right. We do. But unfortunately our churches in America, quote churches and the, and the, religious industrial complex has has changed the standards and and purpose and function of what a church and churches should be to the point it's having very 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 bad consequences on recruiting the really qualified people who are choosing after they get out of seminary to say i i can't stomach this now that i've seen the inside i don't want to be a part of this and they just go they just go to the business world or those who go and they become pastors for a while and they quit they mm-hmm. get out because they're like, I- I've seen the inside of what it's like. I don't want to be a part of this. Yeah. This is very, very sad. And the average layperson has no clue what I'm talking about. But I've been on the inside of it. You've been on the inside of it. We've seen it. 
and and I think it's again part of uh, the sign that God is judging the nation. Mm -hmm, for sure, you know, and and one and one of the areas we'll kind of bring it back a little bit to your book is. And this is where you and I first met was dealing with the whole interfaith dialogue thing. And that's when we started interacting and that sort of thing. Um, and I know that you you deal both with there. There's the error of interfaith dialogue when it comes to theology. Right. But then there's also the error of interfaith dialogue when it comes to national security and when it comes to our safety and that sort of thing. So it's kind of this double edged sword in all reality. Um, yeah. And that's dealing with that's what I deal with in the movie Sabotage. I mm -hmm. mean, this is. This is not dealing with interfaith dialogue from the perspective of now let's pull out our Bibles and do a, a study of Second John nine through eleven, Ephesians five eleven, Romans sixteen seventeen, or Second Corinthians six, uh, six fourteen through seventeen. We could have, but we mm -hmm. didn't do that. Um, we did that at our conference, but we didn't include that part in the film. We dealt with it from a national security standpoint because of the nature of this film. Um, in this book, however, I did go into more of the scripture aspects of it when I dealt with I, uh, IFD. And by the way, they can get the book at MarkChristianity.com, and obviously the logo for, or the URL for the movie is over my shoulder, but MarkChristianity.com for the book. But I'm glad you brought this up from the national security standpoint, because here is a, a paper, and I didn't ask you to ask me this question. You Not just at brought all. It. Yeah, didn't even, didn't even know you had that there. <laughs> no, I had it because I was going to bring it up, but you beat me to the punch. Yeah. But not even knowing I wanted to talk about this. This is a paper that was put out uh, November 9th, 2018. So just what, you know, 10 days ago or so? Mm -hmm. And not even 10 days ago yet. And um, it's put out by the Center for Security Policy. This is a secular think tank out of Washington, D.C. Uh, there are people on their staff that would not claim to be Christians. There are people on their staff that would claim to be atheists. There are people on their staff that come from all kinds of religious background or no religious background or claim to be atheists. I'm sure there's some folks on their staff that would claim to be Christians. The point is, this is just a national security think tank. The man who runs it used to be an assistant secretary of defense in the Reagan administration. There are people working on this uh, think tank that used to be in the national intelligence arena, working for various uh, agencies, whether it's the CIA or other agencies. They put out this report, and what are they talking about in this 35-page report? The threat to our national security through the interfaith dialogue movement. Now, I don't find one Bible verse in this paper. I didn't mm -hmm. find one. Because, again, this was not a treatise from a Christian worldview theological concept. But what did this paper from this secular national security organization say? Evangelicals are the primary And how are they being targeted? Through interfaith dialogue. And it goes on to talk about the Islamic groups, the Muslim Brotherhood, many of the items that I brought up during the whole James White thing that some of your leading evangelicals and ministries uh, criticize us on social media. Well, here are people who are CIA officers who are in the Department of Defense who are highly skilled. Um, these people here actually know what they're talking about. The problem is today we have, dare I say again, more morons that are in ministry. Uh, again, that doesn't mean everyone in ministry is a moron. I'm in ministry. Uh, you're in ministry to a degree. We're all supposed to be in ministry, whether you're in a full-time ministry or not, we're in ministry. Mm -hmm. There are wonderful pastors. There are wonderful elders meet the biblical qualifications. I want to keep reemphasizing that. Right. But we have clowns that are wearing the title, and they're not pastors. They're not elders, and they don't have the common sense, as I said, that God gave my dog, and yet they're leading churches and elder boards. And yet all of a sudden, because they wear the title elder or pastor, even though many of them can't even manage their own finances, they now think they're an expert on public policy and national security. Or, or they think they're an expert on amnesty and voting and the laws and borders and sovereignty. Well, they're not. And in fact, in 1961, the assistant director of the FBI, William Sullivan, gave a speech at the United Methodist Church in Parkland, a suburb of Dallas. And he warned in 1961 that one of the most dangerous things that was facing our nation are these pastors and clergy that get outside of their area of expertise and start signing on to initiatives and movements and causes and speaking about things that are outside of their area of expertise. And so here you have the uh, think tank made up of guys formerly from the Pentagon, formerly from the CIA and other government agencies, saying just from a national security standpoint, interfaith dialogue is a big threat and the target are evangelical Christians. And if that line falls, the country has a serious national security problem because they know and they realize, as two of my friends who are former CIA operations officers told me recently in a dinner at my home, one said, if the Judeo-Christian ethic falls, we're done as a nation. 
Immediately, another one of them spoke up who has a background as a CIA operations officer. Neither one of these would describe themselves as evangelicals. Uh, they just wouldn't, and they wouldn't be offended that I said that. They would be, they would, they would appreciate the fact I was describing them accurately. The next one spoke up right behind the other former CIA operations officer and said, "Evangelicals are the last line of defense. If they break through that line, we're done." So here you had two former CIA operations officers, both are saying to me, "What you're doing in the area of of uh, Christian worldview and reaching out to the Christian evangelical community is very important." Because I said, you know, there are days I wish I was just a secular talk show host and maybe I should go back into secular radio where I started. And one of them spoke up immediately and said that would be a mistake. And I was stunned they said that. Mm -hmm. I was expecting them to say, yeah, maybe you should because, you know, these you know, a lot of these evangelicals are, are uh, just kind of silly people. Uh, I, you know, I just kind of expected that. You know, I don't know. It probably wasn't fair to assume that, but I did. Yeah. And, and immediately he said that would be a big mistake. And I was shocked he said that. Mm -hmm. And I asked why. And he said, because if the Judeo-Christian ethic falls, we're done as a country. And then the other one spoke and said, evangelicals are the last line of defense. If you can't expect evangelicals to stand up against Islam and Marxism, who will? Mm -hmm. And so here they are at, at this organization writing a paper saying IFD is a serious national security threat. But what do we see within evangelicalism? The right-hand man of one Bible teacher who ghostwrites his books tweeting out that Jesus was involved in uh, IFD. And you've got, you know, James White bragging he's going to do it again. Right. You know, and, and, and saying he senses a kindred spirit with Yasser Qadi, who mentored a terrorist, according to Fox News, who himself was mentored by a terrorist, according to Fox News, uh, who uh, is a Jew-hating, Holocaust-denying, Hitler-defending, jihadi-preaching imam. And yet there's no outrage by the right side of even within the right side, meaning the right to the, you know, to the middle, not right as in they're correct. Right. The right leaning side of evangelicalism, many are defending James White. Well, he's one of the good guys. He has a long track record. You know, he gets a pass. But then again, if you're not part of their good old boy club and you do something and your name is uh, Mark Driscoll or Joel Osteen or Rick Warren, they're going to cut you off at the knees. And that's, not, and, that's, and that's not to say that those guys are right by any means, but it's, just, no. it's to show the double standard. They could do the exact same thing as those guys. And but one side will get attacked, one side won't. Well, some did. Uh, year, several years ago, we saw Rick Warren involved in an interfaith dialogue and going and speaking at the Islamic Society of North America and praising him and doing these things. Uh, and he should be criticized. But some of the same people that have criticized John Piper for working with Rick Warren then want to try to uh, splice the words when their boss goes and speaks with at an event with Rick Warren through the National Religious Broadcasters Convention coming up this November, to, uh, March 2019. So there's definitely this, we've got to protect our turf. And I think it's because it's become a business. And again, I'm all for being a capitalist. If you want to run a business, run a business. You know, um, you know, I write books. That's how I make my living. I produce movies. That's how I make my living in part. Um, I, 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 I've had a business since I was 15 years old, 14, 15 years old. By the time I was in high school, I had a very successful lawn service uh, and I loved being an entrepreneur. I love the customer service and servicing my customers and getting to know them and and um, uh, being uh, the one that, you know, maintain their lawn and and cut their grass and trim their uh, sidewalks and hedges and and water their lawns before, before a lot of people had sprinkling systems. And we were dragging sprinklers and hoses around lawns and uh, uh, thatching their lawns in the fall and aerating their lawns. And there were some Saturdays I was making $800 a Saturday aerating lawns. I could aerate a lawn in 45 minutes, two, di two different directions in 45 minutes and make 90 bucks in 45 mm -hmm. minutes. And I would start out before the sun came up and get my uh, Caprice Classic and trailer and get it all hooked up and ready to go. So by the time the sun was up, I was aerating lawns and making $800 a Saturday. Now, I'm not saying all that to boast other than to say that I developed a work, work very young person, young man. And by the time I was in high school, I was making really good money. And when I when I left home and took that money, I then started a commercial cleaning company and I ran that for several years and did very well with that. And then I desired to get into writing books and doing talk radio. And I, again, was doing all this from a secular market area. Uh, then when I wrote my book on education, my first first book on education it was more from a secular standpoint, a little more from a Christian perspective, the second book. And then I crossed from secular radio into Christian radio and began speaking more about Christian worldview. And the reason why you asked me when we began is why, because I realized when I was in secular radio that the solutions to our problems were not politics. We should talk about public policy, both as Christians and non-Christians, but as Americans. But I realized ultimately every issue I was talking about was a biblical worldview issue. So whether we're talking about law, science, economics, history, family, so, so, uh, sociology, 
uh, social issues. All of it came back to a biblical worldview. And when you applied the biblical worldview for both the believer and the non-believer, it worked. And so that's when I transitioned from to politics and secular to having a great interest in the, the, uh, the principles of biblical truth that work for all areas of life. What is marriage? Why is marriage defined this way? How, what, how is economics to run? What is the issue when it comes to borders and laws? What is the purpose and function of government? Those are all biblical worldview issues. So I transitioned. But I, I started out in the business world. And it may shock people. To this day, I run a couple different companies. Mm-hmm. Um, to this day, I make the bulk of my living from for-profit endeavors. Excuse, from for-profit endeavors, I have a nonprofit, but for many, many years, in many of those years, my accountant and tax attorney can show many of those years I never took a salary from that nonprofit, and some years I didn't take anywhere near what I was allowed to take uh, or designated to take for a salary. Why? Because I want to leave those limited funds for our ministry and foundation to go to actually doing things to distribute and expand the ability to put out programming radio and TV for free. So I largely operate today my income from for-profit endeavors that I do off on the side. And for many years, I ran for-profit companies, and then I ran Worldview Weekend part-time because I had to work part-time in the business world and part-time to run Worldview Weekends. And to this day, a lot of what I do off on the side, that's how I make my living. So I don't have to draw uh, salary or very small from our nonprofit ministry foundation side so that the funds are there to do real ministry. I think that's what more people need to look at doing. I'm afraid too many people have gotten into ministry to make a lot of money. Yeah. And if you want to make a lot of money and write Christian books or produce Christian films or, or put together conferences, then go do that as a for-profit uh, venture. But if you're going to come into the ministry side, run it as a ministry. And we've yeah. tried to always keep those two things separate. Um, and I'm a, for that reason mm-hmm. um, that but I think today the the religious side has become a religious industrial complex. So I'm all for capitalism. Capitalism is wonderful. You want to make money, write a book, produce a movie, do whatever you do, develop a product, whatever you want. But today we've turned Christianity, our ministries into businesses. If you want to have an influence on people from a conservative or Christian perspective, and do it in a free market principle idea, go do that. But let's not confuse our our, our uh, businesses with our ministries. And I'm afraid that's what's happened. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. Um, and But what I was going to, I was going to ask you though too, is kind of going a little bit back towards the whole Islam thing a little bit, is why do you think that the church has been, has become so open arms and welcoming to Islam in general, whether it's with interfaith dialogues, whether it's dealing with the refugee issue, whether it's dealing with all different sorts of areas, it seems like we're we're embracing them and welcoming them in with open arms, um, as opposed to exposing their error and their false Jesus and their and all that kind of stuff. Why do you think that there's been such a drastic shift over the last I almost want to say eighteen months? <laughs> uh, I think part of it's spiritual. Mm-hmm. I think a big part of it's spiritual. I think a lot of these people are spiritually blind. And what's really sad is I was telling Sharam Hadi the other night. I said, Sharam, think about this. I have friends. We have we have a, we have friends that are that are not Christians, and they would tell you that, but they understand Islam. Um, I have a friend that's an atheist, but they understand Islam, and they understand the threat of Islam and the threat of Islam to evangelicals better than evangelical some even some evangelical pastors quote pastors. And I said to Sharon, I said, think about that for a minute. That tells us we got a real problem. The, the, the non-believer who is not in any way do, doing anything from a spiritual, they're not into the new age movement. They're not into, you know, Scientology. They're not into anything spiritual per se. They're just, they get up and go to their job and they just deal with the natural world. So they're not doing anything where they're tapping into the demonic or spiritual world through occultic stuff. They're just going about their job. Mm-hmm. Then you have these Christians that are tapping into the spiritual world, and yet they seem to be spiritually deceived and spiritually blind to the truth that is seen by the non-believer. This tells me there's spiritual blindness and spiritual deception over here. Mm-hmm. This person's not even tapping into the spiritual world in the sense that they're doing anything with occultism or spirituality. They, they don't even believe in a spiritual world, per se, some of them. These people do, and yet they're spiritually blind. What's happened? And I think that shows that there's something going on over here spiritually. They've either been deceived spiritually, they're fooling around with something they shouldn't be fooling around with, 
God's given them over. I'm not sure what's going on. But the number one reason I believe is for a lot of these guys, there's something very, very serious going on spiritually. And many of them are spiritually blind and they don't even see it. Many of these guys, I think, are habitual. Um, uh, well, I would just simply say this. I think some of these guys, they, they will say things that are not true. And I don't think they even know what they're saying is, is false. I think they think what they're saying is true when it's not. And again, I think that's a sign of the fact they have a serious, serious spiritual problem uh, and they're speaking out of the fruit of what is at the core of their heart, which is a serious, serious spiritual problem. So I would say, number one, it's a serious spiritual condition. Number two, it is ignorance of Islam. Some people, they just don't know. And so no one has taught them what Islam believes, that the Jesus of the Quran is not the Jesus of the Bible, and they need to be taught. So some of it is ignorance, and you just need to teach people. But for the leaders who are pastors and elders, quote, at pastors and elders that are doing this stuff, there's something seriously spiritually going on that's a real, real problem. Mm -hmm. For sure. And then it, but I believe. do you think that that's in all reality why we've had the blowback that we've had in exposing all this is that there is that spiritual side of things? And then, you know, because again, I never thought that I would be destroyed by the very church leaders that I, that I used to be involved with and look up to and that sort of thing. And it's... It's it's been a wild ride, but it's it's crazy how how harsh and negative and all that kind of stuff is with the feedback that I feel like both you and I and a few others have received. I think we are real seeing, unfortunately, behind the curtain, and that people we we thought we knew and understood were finding out that there's something that's rotten in Denmark. And I go back largely to what qualifies people to be an eld, quote, elder or pastor. We have unqualified people. What is being allowed to be a church, these are not churches, um, is very, very difficult to pastor or shepherd churches of 10,000 people, uh, 15,000 people, 6,000 people, unless you want to have a humongous elder board. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of my friends, uh, Jason Pratt, and I have talked about that. You know, It takes about eight uh, 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 one elder can, can shepherd about eight families. Mm -hmm. One elder can shepherd about eight families. So if you figure you have four average people, a family of four, a mom and dad, two kids, and you divide a church by four, then you should have an elder for that family. And they can handle about eight families. Well, you divide up how big some of these churches are by how many elders they have. You're, they're not shepherding. And their answer to that is, well, you need to get involved in a Sunday school class. <laughs> well, that, that still is one Sunday school teacher to, uh, 40, 40 people, right. uh, you know, or 20 families. I mean, how are you going to do that? So if there's not any shepherding going on, then, then do you really have a church? Or are you just a giant corporation? And then I would say that do some of these people even know how to shepherd? I think these people know how to take a club. I know, I think they know how to beat the sheep, but I don't think many of them know how to lead the sheep. Mm -hmm. And again, I think this is partly because we've missed what is the purpose and function of a church. What is a church? And a lot of them want to know, well, what church do you go to? What elder board are you accountable to? Well, first of all, I'm not accountable to any elder board. Uh, ultimately, I'm accountable to God, and I'm accountable to the Holy Spirit. Um, most of these elder boards are a joke. Not all of them, but most of them are a joke. And if they were to try to start telling me how to run this organization, they would have bankrupted it in the first month. Because all you have to do is go look at their personal finances, and many of them are already filed bankruptcy at least once, or on the verge of doing it now. They have serious credit card debt, multiple credit card debt, uh, their finances are a mess. Uh, they don't know the first thing about the most basic issues of the day, but they think they know it all. But if I were to try to talk to them about biblical worldview issues, within five minutes, they would, they would, they would be looking at me like a deer in headlights. And yet I'm supposed to submit myself to those people? No. There's the church, there's the family, and there's government. And then there's also the, uh, the uh, business uh, that we run uh, in business models, which many of these people would never understand, nor could they anticipate or predict the trends that we did as we did. And then there's uh, parachurch ministries. And there's nothing in the Bible that says I'm to subject myself to them making my business decisions, my financial decisions, my public policy decisions, nor they decide the topics I talk about on radio or TV, the books I write, who I have to speak, nothing. And they can't give me one verse that says I'm to submit to them because there isn't. Mm -hmm. But see, this is, again, what you, when you have narcissistic theological cults wanting to tell people, show up, shut up, and give it up. They want your money. They want your time. But they don't want to have anything to do with actually pouring into your life. Because these people are more interested in beating the sheep, fleecing the sheep, spiritually abusing the sheep, 
but they would never lay down their life for the sheep, nor would they ever serve the sheep. And yeah. that's why they're not qualified to be elders or pastors, and they should they should stop calling themselves such. But isn't it interesting? They want to know where do you go to church, what elder board are you accountable to, like you belong to some cult, you got to check in with them. Well, clearly they have no elder board or real church, because if they did, they wouldn't be able to act like the morons they act like on social media. They would have been uh, fired as an elder immediately and put up on church discipline for the way they behave on social media. And the fact that they don't have an elder board that stops that proves they have a fake elder board, which proves they go to a fake church. So my question to them would be, well, when are you going to start going to a real church versus that fake church or that fake elder board you have? Right. So this is where we're at in the state of evangelicalism. But this all goes back to, again, what is their ultimate motive? Power and control. Power, mm -hmm. money, and control. And no one is to question them. So there's no um, serious interest in what is right, but they're always right. They're always right. I have a friend of mine that's, has, uh, that knows a well-known pastor when – his when he was a young person, he knew his dad and his dad said, you know, the problem with this guy is he, he thinks he's always right. And that's the problem. We have a lot of pastors that that and elders, so-called, that think they're always right. They can't learn from anyone. And, and they immediately assume that what we're saying is wrong or conspiracy theory versus simply saying, well, can you show me the evidence for that? And we would say, yeah, well, here, how, how about this uh, this white paper here, Center for Security Policy? Or how about read this 300 page book with the footnotes and see if what's in there is true? You know, we say things, and they automatically respond that that's fake or that's conspiracy theory. And it's not uh, at all. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think the other thing, too, is these people, so many of them are such ignoramuses. And that that for them to learn something from someone else, they would never humble themselves to do that. And so when they don't know something, their only natural reaction is instead of saying, well, I should check into that and learn something. I mean, I'm learning all the time. I love what I do with my job because I get to learn. And the more I learn, the more I realize how much I don't know and how much more I have to learn. For sure. But but these guys won't do that. Instead, their natural reaction, instead of saying, hey, I didn't know that. He actually knows something I don't know. Uh, or, hey, I was wrong. I didn't know that. They, they're not going to humble themselves and say that. So their only defense is to say, oh, that's conspiracy. Well, what I like to say is just because you're an idiot doesn't mean I'm involved in conspiracies. And that's what it comes down to. These people want to label stuff as being a conspiracy because they don't understand the truth. They don't want to know the truth. And at the end of the day, they're, they're, they're moros. They're mm -hmm. a moron, biblically speaking, a moros. And these are the people leading these fake churches with these fake elder boards. And this is why more and more true evangelical Bible-leading Christians are finding it harder and harder to find a church, yep. which is the one thing that we get in emails over and over and over. I can't find a Bible teaching church. I can't find a church that understands what's going on. I can't find a church that actually understands the times from a lens of a biblical worldview. I can't find a church that actually wants to teach Bible prophecy and understand teaching the Bible in context or the purpose and function of a New Testament church or that I was in the hospital for three weeks. Um, I was out of my Sunday school class in that church for three weeks. Not one person from my church called. My pastors, pastor staff, nobody called. Mm -hmm. But if I, but, but the same family We'll get a letter in the mail saying, we haven't seen you in church. If you're not going to show up, then take your name off the roll. Well, right. why don't you check and find out why they weren't in church? They've been in the hospital for three weeks. So, again, show up, shut up, and give it up. And, uh, and, and, and many people email us saying, we can't find a church. So we have a lot of people who are really the church, mm -hmm. Ecclesia called out one, believers, but they can't find a church. And that this is a very, very sad situation in America. And, and, and there are some good pastors and good shepherds. Yeah. We know them. Sharam Haiti and, you know, um, uh, uh, Mike Spaulding of a Calvary Chapel Church in Ohio. And I could just keep going down the line. Right. Mm -hmm. But but these guys are as frustrated with the, quote, pastors of the day as I as I am. They may be more so because they realize it's a bad reflection on pastors when other pastors act this way. So, again, I want to come back to my disclaimer. There are wonderful pastors and elders and churches out there. But they're becoming few and farther between. But I think the Bible tells us this is going to happen. Yeah. And this is what's going to become commonplace. And I think it's part of God's judgment. And the leaders we're seeing within evangelicalism, I think, is part of that judgment. Yeah. And I, and I think, and I think too, the more the, the more that I interact with people, and you know me, like I try to interact with as many people as I possibly can on Twitter and that sort of thing. But the thing that's been really interesting to me is how educated the lay people are and how uneducated the pastoral staff are. And there's really a hunger and a yearning for godly biblical church leadership. And it's just, it's lacking everywhere you go. I mean, you know, like where I live down here in Southern California, I mean, pretty much every single church is an offshoot of either Rick Warren, TBN, or offshoots of when Mark Driscoll was down here with his Mars Hill church. Like 
there's literally nothing. And But I know a lot of solid Christians that are down here, but nobody can find a good church. And yeah, and I, it, isn't it interesting that the internet and and radio shows and TV shows have come along at this time and are offering up substance and edification and equipping and, and, and ministry to people. You know, I'm not a pastor. I'm not an elder. I don't want to be a pastor. I don't want to be an elder. I don't want to be confused for being one uh, for many reasons. But um, uh, that's not my calling. Um, I, I wouldn't even say I'm qualified. I don't have the temperament for it. Um, but I do want to minister to people. And I think there are a lot of people that are in full-time professions, whether they're doctors or lawyers or construction workers or plumbers or, um, you know, whatever they might be, uh, a carpenter, nurse. Uh, and they want to have a ministry and they want to minister to people and they do have ministries and they do minister to people in their job and their everyday life. And I think that's what we need to be looking for more and more people who are just carrying out a biblical worldview, whatever occupation God's called them in and ministering. Well, as a broadcaster, I want to minister to people, but I'm not a pastor. I'm not an elder. I'm just a broadcaster. I'm an author. And I'm a broadcaster. But at the same time, I want to minister to people. I want to equip people. I want to be edifying and equipping. Uh, I want to talk about things and um, bring a biblical perspective to it. At the same time, I want to be a place where even the non-Christian can say, I may not agree with his Christianity and his biblical worldview stuff, but I sure love it when he talks about public policy. And we do. We have people who email us to say, I'm a new ager, but boy, I sure love listening to your show. <laughs> and I like, often ask them why. And they're like, well, I just like the fact that you know what you believe and why you believe it. I don't agree with it, but I love the fact that you know what you believe and why you believe it. And you can give a reason for it. And then I love hearing you talk about the current events, and, 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 I, and they will say, I agree with you on the social policy issues. I just don't agree with some of your theology. Well, good. Then I want to be someone that can, can be a witness to them and be an, uh, an encouragement to them, and maybe along the way they become a believer. And, and you know what? We have people. We have people who have been atheists or New Agers or Mormons that have emailed us and said, we were listening to your broadcast because we liked your social positions on things and economic or whatever. And eventually, we were convicted by the Holy Spirit and the gospel, and we're believers. I mean, we know of New Agers and Mormons and people that were in the occult that are now believers. So we're trying to be, a, again, I came out of secular talk radio, came into Christian radio and TV, but I still do a lot of topics that on a given day could be on a secular radio show. Mm -hmm. So I'm not a pastor. I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a elder, and I don't want to be defined as one. But I do want to minister to the church, yeah. and the church is a collection of people. And, and I think too many of these professionals out there is about their 501c3 church. i got news for them. The church is a collection of believers, and the church is global, and the church is spread out. And uh, just because they don't go to your church or agree with your fake church and fake elders doesn't mean they're bad Christians. Many of them could preach circles and theology around you. Uh, and you're right. Uh, one of our speakers this past weekend said, I think it was David Hawking, he said that uh, many of the people in the pews have more of a biblical knowledge and understanding than the man in the pulpit. Mm -hmm. And that's becoming very, very, very commonplace. And I go back to the fact that I believe it's all, multiple reasons. One of them is because we've lowered the standards of what it takes to be an elder or a pastor. Number two, this is God's judgment. Yeah. Well, and I, and I feel like, too, I, I totally agree with Hawking's assessment there, but I think a lot of it is that the, the lay people, the people in the church, they're the ones that are reading the Bible and they're the ones that are listening to solid Bible teachers. The pastors are the ones that are listening to favorite conference speakers. They're the right. ones that are just, you know, reading the favorite bloggers, or the favorite whatever it is. And there's the, it's, it's crazy how the lay people are growing, 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 and the church leadership is just sinking constantly. Um, is, and then when you have a good pastor who should be elevated, he's not being elevated because he won't go along with the good old boy club. Or he's not dynamic enough or entertaining right. enough, you know? It, exactly. And we've had some speakers who are not the most entertaining, but their content is so good, but they're some of our most popular programs because our people are interested in the content. They can go and listen to guys that are great communicators who don't have, a, have content, but they're interested in the content. So you're absolutely right. But I'm running into guys who are pastors who, who should be being promoted and elevated, but they don't go to the right seminary. They don't belong to the right club. They don't agree with every little thing about the theology of some group. And even though they agree on the essentials, but they won't promote them. So if you're not a part of the club, you don't pay your dues and join that club, then you don't get advanced. And some of the really good Bible teachers are sitting on the sidelines getting no attention at all 
because the good old boy club, they all promote each other because that's what makes them the good old boy club. They endorse mm -hmm. each other's books. They serve on each other's boards. They speak at each other's conferences. Uh, and it's just an incestuous good old boy club. And the guy who's sitting on the sideline who won't go along with the interfaith dialogue, who's willing to call a spade a spade, who's willing to criticize the Gospel Coalition or Together for the Gospel or some of or John Piper or Moeller, some of these guys, they get black marked and they never get any promotion. And yet then these same guys will stand around and whine that we were the godly leaders for the next generation. Yeah. Well, it's kind of funny. You just keep promoting the same clowns over and over, and then you wonder why we don't have any good leaders. Yeah, and, I, and and in all reality, I can attest to that too because I I come from the good old boy club crowd in that sense. I agree with them on, ev on virtually every theological thing, as you and I have discussed in the past, but they still treat me as a heretic or false teacher simply because I call them out on their crap, essentially. And you, can't, you can't question these people. You right. can never question. And again, maybe it's because I came from the secular talk radio world where you would have callers call in who would disagree with you, yell at you, call you names, and you would engage them. You didn't, and in talk radio, when, in secular radio, you didn't cut them off. Mm -hmm. that, those, those guys were golden. Oh, yeah. <laughs> because talk radio is about controversy, and the more they were angry and calling you names, the more you kept them on and tried to either bring them to your side, which, again, would show your ability to convince someone of your facts, and you, and, and that makes you look good because you were able to keep your cool, bring them to your position, and the conversation's over. They're like, you know what? That's a good point. I'm going to have to consider that now. Or the conversation, they're hostile, and then when you, they get off the line, they're, you're, they're being friendly. You've, you, you've brought them to your, your side. Or they're hostile the whole time, but you keep being nice, and when you're done, people are complimenting you because you were so nice to this guy. You kept giving him airtime, even though he was so rude. Either way, what you're showing is you are here to speak truth and also to have a program that is interesting to listen to. Mm -hmm. And so you're used it to, in the talk radio world, of having that give and take and disagreement and having people disagree with you, and it's okay. In fact, it's often invited. But it seems that in the Evangelical Good Old Boy Club, there is no room for disagreement. There's no room for dissension. And yeah. if you disagree, you dissent. They will come in for the kill. And so while you can say, I disagree with this, I disagree with that, I appreciate you, but not I disagree. No, they, they can't tolerate that. Yeah. But that tells me that this is because these are people who are not in it for the right reasons, and therefore they can never be questioned. Mm -hmm, for sure. And so kind of as we're wrapping up a little bit, but I wanted to kind of bring it back to your book a little bit. And because the main thrust is we have Marxism that's infiltrating our country. We have Marxism that's infiltrating the church, which I never thought that would even be a thing. What should, what should people be looking out for in their local churches to make sure that this kind of thing isn't coming into their local communities? It's a great question, and I deal with it in the book because I have a whole chapter on progressive churches as well as uh, the uh, evangelicalism of today being uh, led by guys like Al Mohler and, and uh, Tim Keller and others. Matt Chandler. I mean, you got Matt Chandler's uh, Acts 29. You've got uh, Mark Dever's uh, Mark's 9. Mark's 9 has like 4,000 churches they've planted. Mm -hmm. And yet, interesting that Mark Dever, in a moment of weakness, apparently slipped up and admitted that his editor, Jonathan Lehman, I think is his name, uh, he, he graduated from the London School of Economics. Uh, some of your listeners may not even know what that is, but that's the Fabian Socialist School. And that's interesting because in the book, Marxianity, I talk a lot about the Fabian Socialist. Who, their logo is a wolf in sheep's clothing. The George Bernard Shaw in 1910 created the, the Fabian window, and it has a wolf in sheep's clothing. Uh, Tony Blair is from the Labor Party. The Labor Party was birthed out of the Fabian Socialist Party. So the Fabian Socialist Party, the Fabian Socialist Society, gave birth to the Labor Party. Tony Blair unveiled the Fabian window uh, when it was rediscovered. It was stolen, missing for a while, was rediscovered. He unveiled it and gave a speech and talked about the Labor Party being birthed out of the Fabian Socialist Society. But in that Fabian window is a wolf in sheep's clothing. Well, Tony Blair is now running the Tony Blair Faith Foundation that is seeking to bring the religions of the world together as one. And so here you have Mark Dever saying that his editor graduated from the London School of Economics, Fabian Socialist School. Well, the social gospel movement was started, the father of it <coughs> is a guy named Walter Rogenbush, a Fabian socialist, who said that socialism will not work in an irreligious country. And what, he, what they declared is we have to hijack religion. And by hijacking religion, we can then implement socialism and people will accept it. Because after all, don't you want to be a good Christian? Don't you want to be like Jesus? Don't you want a spiritual salve for your guilty conscience? So ha have some spirituality. And yet, what did Jesus warn us about in Matthew 24? 
these false teachers, these false prophets, false apostles, false religion, that which have a form of godliness yet deny God. Revelation 17, 1, what do we see? A false dominant church, uh, a, 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 a woman uh, who is a false dominant church that is on many waters, right? A harlot who sits on many waters. She's called a harlot in Revelation 17, 1, who sits on many waters. That's a false dominant church. Then John is transitioned and he has another vision. This time he sees a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. Well, she's also a harlot, but she's not to be confused with the harlot on many waters in Revelation 17, 1, which is the false church. John is seeing a woman on a scarlet beast. That's Babylon on the system of Antichrist. And so you have a false dominant church, and then you have this Babylon and a religious uh, system of Antichrist. And he uses that false church to bring about this global economy, one world economy, one world government. Then at about the middle of Revelation 17, I think right around verse 15, the Antichrist and his ten assistants turn and devour that woman, Revelation 17, 1, eat of her flesh and burn her and destroy her. This now sets up the Antichrist to now be the religious system. So now instead of a one world religious system from a false church, that church has been destroyed, and now the religious system is that of the worship of Antichrist. So now you have a new world religion, the worship of Antichrist, and no one can buy or sell unless they have the mark. And so now you have a one world religion, a new one, a one world uh, economy, and a one world government. And when you set this system up, it then moves you into Revelation 18 with a commercial system all based in Babylon. Uh, again, 17 and 18 is Babylon, 58 miles south of Baghdad. Revelation 17 is not Rome. I used to believe that. I don't now, and I, and I haven't for several years now. But all that to say, how are you going to get there? You have to ha use religion and a false dominant church. And here's Dever saying, hey, my editor is a graduate of London School of Economics. That's Fabian Socialism. I discussed that in Marxianity. You have Tim Keller, who admits in one of his books, as I document in the book Marxianity, that he was influenced by the Frankfurt School. The Frankfurt School came to America in 1933. They're cultural Marxists. They said, we're going to penetrate education and media, education and media, change the worldview of everybody so that they will naturally beg for socialism. We'll destroy the American male, replace a patriarchal society with a matriarchal society. We will destroy capitalism and Christianity. We will set up a victim coalition and blame all the problems on the Christians and the conservatives and the capitalists. So we'll set up the sexual uh, uh, immoral community, where well, they wouldn't have called it sexual immoral. They would have called it like the, um, the uh, LGBTQ type community. Uh, and we'll grab feminists and poor and immigrants, and we'll say, well, who's victimizing them? The white conservative Christians, capitalists. So all of a sudden, if you don't want to mainstream transgender and have your kids going into a trans, you know, bathroom with trans transgenders, well, you're a bigot. If you don't want to bring a bunch of uh, Islamists into your country, jihadis into your country, Muslim Brotherhood into your country, you're Islamophobic. So you're a homophobic, you're Islamophobic, you're a male chauvinist, you're xenophobia. And, you, and, you, and, and so what are you saying? All, the source of all suffering and oppression, Christians, conservatives, capitalists. Well, that's the Frankfurt School and Herbert Marcuse who coined the phrase, make love, not war. And what is Tim Keller admitting in one of his books? He was influenced by the Frankfurt School and, and, and pra praises the concept of the idea. What is he doing? He's planting churches with Lincoln Duncan or planting a seminary in New York, I should say, with Lincoln Duncan. And he and Lincoln Duncan's seminary and Keller and others have a plan on how to carry out the Rick Warren, uh, uh, Bob Buford, Peter Drucker model. Wait a minute. Lincoln Duncan? You mean the same guy at the Gospel Coalition? Tim Keller at the Gospel Coalition? You mean Mark Dever at the Gospel Coalition? You mean Matt Chandler at the Gospel Coalition? And yet these guys keep like Lincoln Duncan, Matt Dever, uh, Lincoln Duncan, uh, Mark Dever, um, uh, Al Mohler. He's doing the same thing through the Okinomia Network and the Common Wheel Project. They keep showing up at some of the most well-known pastors' conferences of the so-called conservative guys. Well, this is all exposed in my book, Marxianity. And what you're going to see is tradition, continue to see is traditional, transitional, transformational. Traditional churches put in transition until they've been completely transformed. Millions of Christian Americans have seen that happen to their own church. Transitioned from traditional to completely transformed. Not even the same church they grew up in or that their father or grandfather started. Now what you're going to see, as I predict in the book Marxianity, is churches are going to start bringing in millions and millions of dollars by being a contractor for local, state, and federal government. They will become social service centers where they're actually distributing through social justice programs local, state, and federal money as contractors, and they will make millions of dollars doing it. 
The one thing, though, is they have to agree not to be involved in any proselytization. So they're going to preach a social gospel and let you think it's the real gospel. They, 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 they preach all this social justice and Marxianity, and then they think they can purify this trash by throwing in the word, oh, we're all about the gospel. Really? Well, which one? Mm -hmm. And so you, I think the model is the Catholic Church, because I typed into a search engine, churches making millions of dollars on social services when I was doing the research for Marxianity, and up popped an article from The Economist magazine that said that 62% of the money the Catholic charities in America get, 62%, come from local, state, and federal governments. Wow. So they're they're just getting a piece of the pie. The model's already been tested, by the way, by the amnesty program under the State Department and the United Nations and Obama. Several billion dollars was allotted for Christian ministries to bring illegals in here to America, immigrants, Muslims, and drop them down and then tell your church this is what Jesus would do and, and we have to have amnesty and and uh, and those those so-called Christian ministries uh, whether they're charity, uh, Catholic charities or Lutheran social services or world vision, go look that up. You'll see they're getting millions of dollars. So the model's already been tested. The Catholic church has already been doing it. Now watch the quote Protestant evangelical churches get in on the money and they got to find the money to make up for the older people that are either leaving or dying. And the younger people, they're leaving the church. Or if they're there, they're not about to give. Yet, I went on the Huffington Post, as I quote in the book, Marxianity. I found multiple articles where the young social justice millennials are saying, if you will do the social justice thing, not only will we show up, we will give and we will be your free workers. So think about the model. You now are giving local, state or federal money for being social service centers. You get the social justice warriors who are coming back. They're putting their own money into the pot to be redistributed, and they're willing to be the free workers to be the social service center workers at your new social service center that used to be a church. So now your pastor has become a community organizer and your church a community organization. And who is leading the way for this? As I document, Lincoln Duncan, Tim Keller, Rick Warren, um, and many others are doing this. And that's what you've got to be watching for. For sure, totally. And so, so what what are the signs that your local pastor is buying into this stuff? Is he staying in the gospel coalition? Yeah. Is he going to, to together for the gospel? Where you got David Platt st staying there and crying and sniveling that we're all immersed in racism and the church is deepening the divide of racism and his examples of that are high unemployment in the black community. Hey, David. Uh, have you not seen that we're at record low unemployment with the blacks and Hispanics under Trump? But I guess you don't want to bring that up. That fits your narrative. Yeah. You got Matt Chandler telling HBO, Barack Obama, great guy. Uh, and the problem with Barack Obama, he said, was the pastors weren't willing to explain his policies to their church members. And so it freaked them out and they sold their soul and voted for Donald Trump. Wait a minute. If the pastors were to explain the good socialist Marxist policies of Barack Obama, and how great they are, then Barack Obama's policies would have been accepted, everything been fine, Matt Chandler? Mm -hmm. Well, again, this is proving my point of Marxianity, that he thinks Barack Obama was a great guy and his policies just needed to be better explained by the pastors and everybody would have accepted them. <laughs> these, 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 these simpletons, Romans 1 fools, are making my point of the book. And yet, look at who shares the platform with Matt Chandler and David Platt. And doesn't seem to have the guts to call them out. Look who signs on to these social justice initiatives and then the next week runs to Nashville and speaks at a conference that Tim Keller is speaking at. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, this is, this is, I mean, how stupid do they think we are? Well, the cat's out of the bag. It's in the book Marxianity. And people are going to be shocked at the names that are in there. And there's a nice little uh, index at the back for topic and people so you can see what your favorite evangelical leader is up to. Right. I don't know what's causing some of these guys to lose their minds. Uh, and, and go in the ditch, but many of them are. And uh, uh, so one of the signs would be, are they staying in the Gospel Coalition? Are they staying with Together for the Gospel? Are they reading the books by Matt uh, Chandler, David Platt, uh, to Betty? Um, are they following um, uh, you know, Mark Dever, Tim Keller? Are they a part of their network? Are they going to the schools of Lincoln Duncan and Reform Theological Seminary and buying into his model? You know, it's funny, Lincoln Duncan says it Together for the Gospel. He doesn't groove on cultural Marxism. Well, that's funny because you're hanging out with some of the leading cultural Marxists, and now you've actually planted a seminary with Matt, uh, with Tim Keller. So these guys, I think, are educated beyond their intelligence. And the funny thing is I've offered for them to come on my radio show. Come mm -hmm. on my radio show. We're live. You can't be edited. 
Right. I can never get Al Mohler for years to come on. Most of these guys, I guess, are just flat out cowards. They, mm -hmm. I cannot get them to come on my show. I would love to get Lincoln Duncan on the air and ask him, what do you really know about Tim Keller? Do you really agree with what he says in his books, Generous Justice and some of these other books? Do you really believe these ideas? Because if he really does, then that says a lot. If he doesn't, that says a lot. None of these guys are going to do that. It's easier for them to criticize me, call me a conspiracy theorist or a nut or or ask all other kind of distracting questions, or go after my uh, my uh, teenage daughter on social media and grab pictures of her in a bathing suit and send out there to uh, to ministry leaders I work with to try to criticize me. Really? So that's that's the equivalent of what you got, huh, boys? Is going after pictures of my underage daughter in a bathing suit? What a bunch of perverts! Mm -hmm. That's what they've got. That's all they've got. You know why? Because I'm good at what I do. I'm good at what I do. This is my 14th book. I do good research. I, I, I work hard. I endeavor to do it. I have ca file cabinets full of this. This is what I do. I footnote it. I document it. I have tons and tons of external hard drives with their quotes and sound bites and videos. This is what I do. I have a whole worldviewpedia.com that has it documented. So they know they can't come up against me on the facts. All they're left to do is go after my underage teenage daughter, attack my wife, who's not a public figure, or criticize me, which again shows you what a bunch of Romans one debased, darkened heart fools we're dealing with in evangelicalism. But these are the so brain trust. If this is the brain trust of evangelicalism, Lord, come quickly, because you've got a bunch of fools running modern-day evangelicalism, literal Romans 1 fools who are so debased and darkened, they don't even realize how spiritually blind they are. For sure, 100%. You know, and I, and I feel, you know, I've experienced some of those attacks myself. I know that you've, I know that you've experienced a lot of the craziness of, of the attacks from these, the, the good old boys club and the evangelical elite and that sort of thing. Um, and so, but finally, like, as, as we're ending... What's the solution to this? Because, because like we get the problem, we understand, we get mar Marxism, we get that these guys are compromising, we get that essentially all of the big name guys are compromising in some way or another. So now, I don't know if I would say all of them. I don't want to give them that room to criticize you or right. me by saying all of them, but a lot of them. Yeah, essentially, yeah, yeah. And so, so what? So what's what ultimately is the solution? How 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 do we fix this? within the same the church. way you deal with the liberals the same way you deal with the liberals is the way you deal with this crowd and brood of vipers many of them is by doing what jesus did he exposed them front on right away took on their issues asked a lot of questions went right to the heart of the issue and that's what we've got to do when we see david platt say the church is immersed in racism and the church is deepening the divide and you say well how david well, David goes on to say, well, look at unemployment in the black community. Well, really? So, so you're telling me that the Christians in the church are, are now running the labor department? He says crime in the black communities. Oh, you mean we're in charge of the police departments in downtown Detroit or in Chicago? No. And by the way, go look at the towns and cities that are in such bad shape with their crime, their unemployment, <laughs> their schools. Quit that. Is, is, who, who's running those schools? Black superintendents, black school uh, city uh, school boards. Who's running the police departments? Black chief of police. Who's running that that city hall? A black mayor. I mean, let's get real. Mm -hmm. uh, and 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 the issues even in the towns where it's predominantly white. If you have problems, is that white Christian evangelicals running those towns? No. The problems of high, high unemployment, which have come down. The problem of crime, the problem of bad schools, the problem of uh, uh, lack of level entry jobs goes back to the stupid socialist policies that have destroyed the level entry jobs. Things like mandatory minimum wage. Go watch Walter Williams on that, a black economist. Go watch Thomas Sowell on that. Go talk about Star Parker on that or Michael Massey on that. All black conservatives who, by the way, make appearances in Sabotage the Movie. So, again, David Platt is, again, a useful idiot, in my opinion, who is a typical Romans 1 fool who doesn't even know what the problem is so correctly to be able to address the problem. First, got to know what the problem is correctly so you can address it. But how do you deal with guys like that? You go right to the facts, as we did in our TV show on him, as, we do in the, as, as I do in the book Marxianity. I went right to the issues. You're saying unemployment is the fault of capitalist Christians, the church? No. And I go to the issue. So everything is an information operation. These guys are carrying out a propaganda war, an information operation, fake news. And the way you counter it is by putting out the truth and exposing them for what they are. The Bible tells us to destroy the arguments raised up against the principles of the Lord. And in, re in reality, many of these people, that's what they're doing. They are 
uh, just trying to destroy the foundations of what is a biblical New Testament church, the purpose and the function of a New Testament church, and the purpose and function of a pastor. And we should destroy those arguments they're raising up by putting in the biblical principles and then exposing the liberal social justice ideologies that they're producing that don't line up with the scripture. But from a public policy arena, we can show how their policies have failed, who created them, and that it is not the conservative Christian capitalist that created the problem. It is the socialist, Democrat, or socialist, uh, Fabian socialist, communitarian, globalist, Republican. D uh, David Platt was so ignorant, he actually mentioned the book he was getting the trash from at Together for the Gospel. He said, it comes from a great book available in the bookstore, Divided by Faith. I went and looked it up. Written by two progressives. One of the authors that wrote, wrote a book in 1991 defending liberation theology, which is Marxism mixed with Christianity for Marxianity. Yeah. So the solution to a lot of this is to look at what they're saying, is it true, and then if it's not true, expose it for what it is. We never go after people personally. I will never, ever go after someone personally, their children, their spouse. Um, I don't even talk about people when I know they got problems in their own personal marriage or finances. I never go after someone personally. Their personal problems. You know, I know of, of a guy who's had issues um, w w with drunk, drunk driving and other things. I just don't go there with people because yeah. the issues I deal with need to be addressed about the issues, not personal problems or personal failings or mistakes people make. That I'm not interested in being a tabloid. And I see a lot of these blogs and websites that are nothing more than Christian tabloid trash. So some of the people I deal with, we could certainly go personal, but I'm, that's not right to do to them. That weakens our position, and that takes the issue off the issue and puts it on something sensational or uh, titillating. I don't do that. Stick to the issues, debate the issues. And as soon as you see someone coming after and making personal attacks versus addressing the issue, you know you're dealing with a moron and someone that cannot refute the facts, so they go to attacking the messenger, which shows you they're a fool. Yeah, and I, and I do want to clarify, too, for people that are watching. When we're talking about personal attacks, it's not that we're it's not that we're saying we're not going to name names. It's not saying that we're not going to go after somebody for what they say. It's that we're not going to go off of peripheral things that have absolutely t nothing to do with what they say. And I think a lot right. of people get that right. mixed up. Right. No, we're going to talk about public issues, the public person, what they write, what they say, the policies they embrace, the groups they're promoting, the chords they're signing. We're not going after their personal life. Mm -hmm. We're not going after them personally. We're not looking to be mean to people. Yeah. We're not looking to um, uh, to be unkind. We want to be we want to be gentlemen debaters. Yeah. Okay. And we can debate tough and hard. Mm -hmm. And, and, it, and, it can, and it can be a lively debate too. It'd be very yeah. lively. But at the end of the day, we can still be nice. Mm -hmm. You know, Ronald Reagan was good at that. He he was good during a debate, and he would go right for the issues. But at the same time, he was likable and he was winsome. You know, I think if if the whole James White thing had been handled differently, um, I think James White could have come to our TV studio and we could have sat at the desk and talked it out. 100% disagreed, but people could have seen that we shook hands and were nice to each other even after a hardcore debate. Totally. But, you know, a lot of these neo-Calvinists, hyper-Calvinists, neo-Calvinists, they're just, they're just fr fr frankly, they're just not very nice people. And I think their theology in a lot of ways, their extreme Calvinism in a lot of ways, lends, lends to that. Not that that can't go on with people who are not into the whole neo-Calvinist or extreme uh, Calvinist world. It can. But I think there's a personality problem with some of these people that lead them into being just very nasty people so that you can't get together and say, hey, let's have a, a tough debate on the issues, really go at it, but do it in a way where we're not personal and unkind to each other. But, yeah, it's a rigged you know, rugged, tough debate. We might even interrupt each other and step on each other when we're talking and debating back and forth. But at the end of the debate, we're going to shake hands and we're going to go out to dinner. Mm -hmm. Why can't we do that? You know, yeah. Ronald Reagan used to do that with Tip O'Neill. Why can't we do that? For sure. Totally. And, and sad thing is, I don't, I don't, sad thing is I don't really see that changing too, too soon, even, even though I really wish that it would. Well, it's now ramping up to the point of the civil discourse. And now they're showing up at people's homes. Now yeah. they're shutting operates now it's violence and now we have people in this good old boy club you know tweeting out uh where my family goes to church mm -hmm. and we have our church and then they want to get online and lie and say oh, we never do we never doxed his family right i don't even know what doxed mean but i guess it means that you put out private information about them right 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 and yet then we've provided a screenshot where the uh right hand man of a bible teacher who ghost writes his books um you know did 
one of his employees put on a tweet right where I go to church. And then the guy wanted to say, well, I, he, we never attacked his wife. I never mentioned his wife. And I think we provided a screenshot, or you did. Yeah. And he said he could be proven. He'd delete his Twitter account, right? Mm-hmm. That's, and that, that's very right. For a whole, deleted it for a whole two days, right? And it, it, like, I think it was an entire two days, which in all reality, I thought was longer than, than he would. But, well, but, then he, but that, that, you know, we never encourage people to find his home address. It was, he was, it, he says, uh, Brandon was putting his own address out there everywhere for people to see. No, I wasn't. I mm -hmm. put out our PO box and our, our, our address that was a UPS store or a pack mail. It wasn't my physical home address by, by the very nature of the line of work. I've always put out a address that wasn't my home address. So for him to say, well, Brandon's put out his own address out there. That's baloney. Mm -hmm. uh, either he's lying and knows he's lying or he's confusing my pack mail or my UPS store address, which is a physical address, but at a pack mail or a UPS store for being my home address. So I've never put my home address out there. Right. Um, you had to go looking for it. And yet he kept getting on social media. One of these executive directors of this so-called Bible ministry talking about how easy it is to find his home address after knowing that a guy had showed up at my conference with two guns and a Quran and then brandished five weapons and 1200 rounds out in the parking lot and threatened me and was federally charged with terroristic yep. threats. And yet right below his text, where he, a tweet where he kept talking about how easy it is to find my address. And he kept coming back to that over the course of a few days, like he was egging people on. And then finally, right below his tweet, we have a screenshot of someone tweets out a map right to my front door. And then he wants to claim he didn't do this or they right. didn't go after my wife, who's not a public figure. Mm -hmm. This is the kind of people we're talking about. In my opinion, these are Romans 18, debased, darkened heart, Romans 1 fools. They're not qualified to be elders. They're not qualified to be pastors. And if this is the kind of elders they want to have, then I would say the people that have these kind of elders don't have a church. Right. Because that's not a biblical model. To be a biblical church, you have to have biblical qualified el elders. doesn't mean you have perfect elders. There is no such thing. But there are, are qualifications to be an elder. And if you can't meet those, you can't be an elder. And if you don't have elders that are qualified, you don't have a biblical New Testament structure, government structure, and you're not a church. And that's the problem we have today is we got a lot of people running around playing games. They're about money and power. They're about their club. Uh, they're about a religious industrial complex instead of just doing the right thing and acknowledging we all have feet of clay. None of us are perfect. We all have areas we can improve on. We have all areas we can surrender to Christ more in the area of sanctification and the washing of the water and the Holy Spirit, the washing of the water and the word. But these guys today just get down flat, flat out nasty. And mm -hmm. you notice even in this interview, we haven't named it. We haven't really named many names. Right. Um, because, again, I'm not trying to be unkind. They know who they are. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but what I'm also finding is hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people on social media that are watching have figured this out. Yeah. So a lot of them are destroying themselves. And I cannot tell you the number of emails I've received from lawyers, um, uh, medical doctors, professionals that have ceased sending money to some of these most popular, well-known Bible ministries because they've seen the behavior of their elders and staff on social media, and they've said, we're done. Yeah. They're also seeing who the leaders of some of these ministries and churches are sharing the platform with, and they're done. Mm -hmm. And so reality is people are figuring it out, and we don't even have to go personal. Yeah. You know, if I, if, I, if, I, if I wanted to find someone's home address, I could do it, but I would never put out the home address of someone. I would never put their family at risk. I would never put them at risk. Mm -hmm. much less their spouse or their children, but I encourage anyone to ever go look up their home address or egging someone on as though they should then, underneath my tweet, put up their home address. I would never go stalking onto the social media page of any public figure, liberal, Republican, Democrat, Christian, non-Christian. That's just creepy. Mm -hmm. Why do you stalk the social media pages of people's children? What does that have to do with the public policy issues we're talking about? Right. I think this shows you what debased people we have, and in some cases, just outright perverts. Mm -hmm. And when you go look at what some of these people have said on, online about women and about how men think, or you go and you look online at some of the people they've defended who are accused child molesters, uh, and I'm talking about more than one case, when you start looking at what some of these people have done inside mainstream evangelicalism and what they're doing, defending and saying, some of these people, I think, again, are proving they are Romans 118 people that are foolish and their hearts are darkened and they suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And sadly, these are some of the leaders of of uh, churches. Mm -hmm. And this, again, is why we have Marxianity. This is For why sure. we're sabotaging our own country from within. And this is why evangelicalism will not be the last line of defense yeah. that, that upholds the constitutional republic. It will be penetrated. Because we're putting people into positions of authority within the evangelical church and within evangelicalism that should never be there. And that's how we're being compromised in one way from within. A hundred percent. And I think that there's there's so many parallels between the Reformation, like with Martin Luther and what he was going up against with the Catholic Church, and then what we're seeing now. 
And I think we have to realize from looking back at history is that in all reality, I, th- I think we're we're coming up on it's going to be a big fight. It's going to be a battle in order in order to bring the church back to the way that it should be. Like we're going to get a lot of resistance I mean, look at the reformers. They had a lot more resistance than we're even going to see, but it's still going to. Yeah, we're not see- going to be. We're not going to be killed anytime soon. Right. Probably. I mean, we could be by some of the, the Islamists or Antifa groups, but I, I don't. I don't see any of the uh, evangelical guys being violent. No, not um, at so, so, not at all. So it's not like we have to worry about that. Mm-hmm. So if the reformers can go through that, what they went through to reform uh, that day, surely we ought to be able to contend. In this day, exactly, and I, and I think and I think that we have to some of re- these guys couldn't walk up the stairs without being winded, so I'm certainly not that afraid of them. Yeah, well, that that's a true statement, but <laughs> so uh, well, uh, I really want to thank you for coming on and and just kind of explaining everything and having this conversation. So I really encourage everybody to buy the book, buy the movie. How can people, you know, buy them? I'm sure it's on your website. How how can they? Well, do there's that? just been a website above my head the whole time. I did not see that once. You didn't really. <laughs> no, I didn't. Yeah, I'm, I'm a I'm a capitalist. You know, one of those yeah. evil capitalists that 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 the uh, Marxianities are so against. Uh, Mark, so that sabotage the movie.com or Marxianity.com, Marxianity.com, yeah. and sabotage the movie is six hours, as I've already said. But the last hour is all about Marxianity. So I close off with showing how they're penetrating evangelicalism, just as the Center for Security Policy again warned about in their paper, a, 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 a secular think tank, national security think tank saying, hey, they're penetrating evangelicalism. They realize if they can take this down, they can take down a big chunk of America. If it wasn't for evangelical voters, Donald Trump wouldn't be president. So think about the fact, if they can take down the evangelical voting block, uh, they can elect progressive presidents. So you don't have to agree with everything Donald Trump has done, but he has brought us low unemployment. He has brought us uh, attempting to try to do a stronger national security. He's moved the uh, uh, capital uh, or the uh, embassy for uh, for uh, our, our U.S. embassy for, uh, to Jerusalem, making that obviously the capital of Israel. They've moved it to the capital, our embassy. I mean, there's so many things he's done that as an evangelical Christian I can agree with. There are obviously things I, I wish he wouldn't say or do or some of the things in the past, but uh, I pray for him, and, and uh, we should pray for him. But I think God has given us a little bit of a reprieve by having him. But as I said before he was elected and the day after, I believe the election of Donald Trump is part of God's protection and blessing at, and part of God's judgment at the same time. Um, I really do. I, I believe God is giving us a little more time, but I also believe God is using Donald Trump to draw out the enemies of America. And look what's happening. And so I think the backlash upon conservatives and Christians after Donald Trump is out of office is going to be intense, more so and quicker than it would have been. So in one sense, God allowing Donald Trump to be elected is going to bring more persecution. It already is. So that's why I wrote the article on our website. I said the election of Donald Trump can be a blessing as well as part of God's judgment. They can both be true at the same time. They can be used to draw out the enemies of our country. I even saw today in an article on Drudge where Donald Trump is saying, we may just pull out of the United Nations altogether. That's a fascinating comment from Donald Trump because many people have wondered, how would the United Nations ever leave America? Mm -hmm. Their building, by the way, is in great disrepair, I'm reading. It has been for a long time. And so there is the UNESCO, United Nations Education Scientific Cultural Organization, first led by Julian Huxley, who I write about in Marxianity, um, who was encouraging, by the way, the merging of Marxism and Christianity. But the group UNESCO, they've been pushing for a long time for moving the United Nations to Babylon, 58 miles south of Baghdad. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's two folks that teach at the Army War College that I write about in my book, The Coming Religious Right, that have stated why it would be a good idea to move the United Nations to Babylon. We have one of the biggest embassies in the world that we built in Baghdad, so not too far away. What am I saying? If Donald Trump is serious about pulling America out of the United Nations, and I'm not sure that he is, but if he does, why would why would the United Nations have a reason to stay here? And so what I'm saying is God has been using leaders for a long time to set up his plan and to fill, fulfill his purposes uh, prophetically. And Donald Trump is helping to draw out the enemies of America and maybe even to reposition some things that go on in the world, setting up that end-time scenario. So um, these are exciting times to be alive. And if you want to understand those biblical worldview issues from the area of law, science, economics, history, family, social issues, Islam, Marxism, the Middle East, come on over to worldviewradio.com. Come on over to WVWTV.com and listen and watch for free and maybe get the book Marxianity or maybe get the movie, the docu-movie uh, Sabotage. But these are exciting times to be alive. For sure. Totally. And so and people can follow you on Twitter, on on Facebook as well. 
and uh, just kind of keep up on everything that's going on. And because I know you and all of your contributors are constantly, you know, keeping everybody in the loop with what's going on. I know you have you have a lot of great people that are contributing to Worldview Weekend. So I'm really appreciative to you and Worldview Weekend. And in all well, reality, I, you you guys gave me my start, so I'm thankful well, for thank that too. You. And by the way, that was your decision to pull your program, not mine. Yes, yes, a hundred percent. You know, and I think it, and going back to the all the personal attacks and all that kind of stuff for me i just felt like i didn't want even though we know how attacking all those guys are i don't want my decisions and the things that i stand for to affect other people so i'd rather go out on you my were own. very and very gracious to try to get me out of that uh spot where i was being uh, blasted on at a time it was already being blasted and you called and said look what decisions i'm making should not fall back onto you and have consequences for you. Let me step aside. You were very gracious in that. But uh, even our uh, people that hate us tried to then use that to pit you and I against each other. But uh, you and I didn't. Pl- we we knew what they were up to. Oh yeah, for sure. You know, you know, and that's that's the thing is that we're on the we're on the same side. We may disagree on, on certain theological issues, yeah, but, I, but we're I, on I, the same you and side. I do not agree on Calvinism. No, not at all. And, and look how nice we are to each other. I know it's it's like a shocker. I don't think I've ever seen anybody else on a podcast with, that's <laughs> as agreeable as us. <laughs> And yet I don't agree with you on Calvinism. Exactly. But yet my friend Tommy Ice is a Calvinist, and we produce his TV show. He's a free grace Calvinist, so mm-hmm. I come closer to him. You know, more, I, I would be more like Tommy Ice or, or Charles Ryrie, but I'm not a, I'm not a Calvinist. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a biblicist. I'm like uh, uh, Andy Woods in that area. But I have friends that are Calvinists. We produce shows of people that are. I, I can handle the free grace Calvinists like Charles Ryrie and Tommy Ice, obviously. They're dispensationalists, mm-hmm. and they're – free grace Calvinist. I just have a problem with the extreme Calvinist, but you're not an extreme Calvinist. And that's one reason why we get along so well. Right. But even if you were, I can still get along with extreme Calvinist as long as they don't, as long as they don't want to go personal and just be mean. Well, yeah. You I, know. Look, I have friends again that are atheist. I, I have friends that are agnostic. I have friends that are into socialism, mm-hmm. that are into social justice. I have friends that have been Hindus. I like people. I right. tend to like people. I want to get along with people. But I do have core convictions, and I'm not going to back down on those core convictions. And if you want to battle and debate, I'm going to do it. And if you can't win the debate, don't go personal. And right. yet that's what they do. That's yeah. what they do. They lose the debate, and I'm sorry uh, if the truth is on my side and, you're, and, and, and they lose the debate. But that's mm-hmm. usually what happens. I mean when you're out there tweeting Jesus was involved in interfaith dialogue, you know that's just 100% false, and I can prove it, and I have. Yeah. And I'm sorry you made a stupid comment, look stupid saying it, but – don't get mad at me. You tweeted something you shouldn't have tweeted. Right. You know, or, or whatever it might be. The point is this. We can disagree and say things and disagree and even and even uh, adamantly disagree. But we ought to be able to be nice to each other and we ought to be able to not attack each other's family members or 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 put at risk people's security, mm-hmm. uh, particularly when they know they've already been threatened by encouraging people to look up where they live or having one of your employees tweet where you go to church. Right. This is this this isn't hard. I mean, having personal decorum and how you behave with people isn't hard. So I can get along with a lot of people that I don't agree with in a lot of areas, and I do. I have a mm-hmm. lot of friends I don't agree with, but I like them as people. Totally. But you know what the reality is? Some of these people, on a personal level, they're just not very likable. So maybe that's why they have a hard time getting along with people, because they don't try to be likable. Yeah, I mean, in, in, all, I, in all reality, that could be. I, but yet I have friends that are very liberal, but they, they work at being likable. Mm-hmm. You know, they work at getting along. They work at being friends. Yeah. And that's the way we should be as Christians. Should it not? For sure. A hundred percent. You know, and I think, and I think that the, the thing is, is that if you notice, like with, with a lot of our interactions on social media and that sort of thing, as soon as we start get closer and closer to the main point and proving our case, that's, they when, go that's, that's when the personal attacks, that's what happened with you. And when they went after your family members, it's what happened with me when they went after my family members. And it's like, as soon as you get it, the closer and closer you get, all of a sudden now they go personal. But that shows you they're not interested in the truth. Exactly, or else, or else they'd be involved in the debate. Exactly. So yeah. So well, want, really want to thank you. I think that this is going to be our longest podcast ever. But, How long uh, we been doing? Two hours and thirteen minutes. <laughs> you gotta be kidding. No. How much was I being paid? Was it was it two hundred dollars an hour? Uh, I I I only agreed to one fifty, but you know. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I figured we had to be going close to two hours. Yeah. Yeah, it was fun. It was totally. Fun. Thank well, you. thank you so much. And I really, I really appreciate it. And I really appreciate all your support and our well, friendship and, and for, that sort of thing. Thank you for using your, your digital platform to promote my book and, and new movie. So thank you, Jeff. And of thank course. you for 
thank you for having my back on social media. Even even though we don't agree on everything, you've had my back on social media. Totally. Hey, I, again, again it, it, it comes down to the truth. And, and if somebody's going to go after you for something that has either nothing to do with the truth or they're attacking the truth, I feel like we should all be sticking up for what, wherever sure. the truth lies, you know? So. Exactly right. So, so thank you. Of course. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you, brother.